Welcome to Codex Rex, the video game history podcast. I'm your host, Tyler. And I am your co-host, Dax. Each episode, we tell a story about video game history so that you can learn a little bit more about the games that you love. And before we start off, maybe we should say that this is episode 26, and there's an episode that comes with this episode. So if you want to like get the whole thing, just stop it now, go back to episode 25, listen to that one, and then come back here. And now you can go on with whatever you wanted to ask me. Yeah, get out of here. If you haven't listened to the previous episode... Uh, actually, so um, we're going to be talking about Pokemon this episode, uh, which you will be able to see in the name of the episode, which should be called Pokemon. Uh, we did a previous episode about Game Freak, and it gives you a lot of the context that you need to perhaps enjoy this episode more. You do not have to listen to it, but as Doc said, it's probably a good idea to do so. And with that being said, my man Docs, what have you been up to? What are you doing, man? I have been playing Darkest Dungeons. I mean, we have recorded like uh, a week ago or something. Yeah. I don't know. And I've I've done I've not changed my video game schedule since then. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much all I've been doing as well. Um, that and just putting together a bunch of Warhammer miniatures, as is my natural state in life. So I've seen I've seen you post these rescue pods. Mm -hmm. How how do you play those? Like. Like, are these actual figures you put on the board and then they do something for you? Yeah, so those figures that you're talking about that I put in the Discord, um, so there's a there's a variant of 40K called Kill Team. Yeah. And you, instead of this massive army, you have, like, anywhere from, like, three to 12 guys. Oh, right? yeah. And you have, like, a small team. And so the latest season that they did was about a band, uh, ex exploring, like, abandoned ships. And they're called Space Hulks. And uh, some of the missions have escape pods, and some of the missions will be like, the ship you're on is crumbling, get to the escape pods. And then like you try to like race your opponent as you're like shooting each other to get the oh. escape pods. And they, the little pod part in that picture, the pod comes off of the base to denote that it has fired off. And then you remove your minis from the board. It was very cool. Ah, that's really yeah. cool. So, And you can also variably put them anywhere on the map or something, so that's why you have the mess yeah so thing. yeah each mission might tell you where the escape pods go or like i was building some, like, like okay, a med I get room it. or something like that go get first i was like is this some new warhammer figure in the army and it's just like escape pods and they stand around <laughs> to do nothing uh i mean like like i don't understand warhammer anyway but space marines do have something called a drop pod and it hits the it, it's a giant model and it hits the board you know based on wherever you put it mission or whatever and it'll hit it'll hit the board and unfold and then your guys come out of it they're not physically in it but like your guys come out of it and then it remains on the board so like that's like i mean that's that's been done in, in 40k for a long time can it really open up no it actually can open up yeah like it unfolds oh yeah it's really well you sick. have to you have to do like put like dry dry ice in it and then <laughs> put like all the fog would come out and then it must like it explodes or something that would be nice yeah that would be really cool if it exploded. Just, yeah. just explode the whole team. That's a power move. That's a real power move. I, I don't give a fuck about your figures. I'm going <laughs> to blow it all up. <laughs> there are okay, really um, vehicles exploding, and I do think that you know it really asserts your dominance over your opponent when you blow up. <laughs> actually do it. Actually. So. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so shall we shall we uh, just do some housekeeping stuff and then get into this? Yes. Okay, per usual, you can find us on Twitter. We also now have a subreddit, which reminds me, our good friend Hopped, who is one of our regulars and longtime listeners, was dismayed that in the previous episode, I referred to the people who put together the uh, subreddit as just they. They did this. It was Hopped. Hopped was doing it secretly. And uh, he deserves the, the full credit there. Um, so Hopped, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, you can find yeah, us... Tyler's, on... a, Tyler's kind of a dick sometimes. I'm sorry, Hopped. Uh, his not fault, intentionally, not usually, but I mean, <laughs> I have my days. Uh, yeah, so we are on Twitter. We have a subreddit. Uh, if you want to email us, if you ever want to give us episode ideas, if you ever want to help us do research, you can uh, send me an email at codexrexpodcast at gmail.com. And I'm on Twitch. I'm Vegan Tyler. And that's it. That's all you need to know about the various places you, you can know. find us. Yep. So okay. does this mean we can start the episode? It does. Let's do it. Let's go.
Okay. Last time when we spoke, we talked about the history of the uh, Japanese game company Game Freak and how uh, Satoshi Tajiri, um, who is one of our characters here, uh, put together a magazine when he was a teenager called Game Freak, and he met a whole bunch of people through that, and uh, eventually they established a company, Game Freak, uh, which will be the topic of today. And throughout that time, they were working on a game called Capsule Monsters, which we now know as Pokemon. Um, when we last left our intrepid heroes... I guess we'll call them. There was a bit of an issue, and we'll get to that in a minute. I think what would be prudent is to recap at least the four main people that I think of when I think of this story. Okay, one is Satoshi. Mm-hmm. He's kind of like and the brains behind the operation, right? He, he came then, up with the original idea and got the crew together. There was the one guy that was really into anime. Ken Sugimori. And, yep. Yeah. He's the team's lead artist. Uh, wanted to be a manga artist, but ended up... Uh, Shifting over to game development and joining the company officially. Can I can I think of another one? No, I don't think so. I think I forgot the last. What's the other ones? Do you remember Music Guy? Oh yeah, Music Guy. What's his name? Junichi Masuda. Uh, so ah, okay. Music and he does some like programming and design work for the company. Mostly the Music Guy. And then um, there's a uh, Sunekazu Ishihara. He's like the friend uh, who was working for different companies who would constantly kind of like give them the hookup, right? Like open the door and yep, 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 yep. for them. Set up the deal with Nintendo, things like that. Ah, okay. uh, yeah. So Tajiri, Sugimori, Masuda, and Ishihara. Those are kind of the big four. When we last left uh, Game Freak, they had just lost all of their programmers on a single day. Basically, conditions at the company had gotten bad enough that all of the programmers quit. Um, there were three of them at the time. And the company at this time had commitments for multiple games, and they were still trying to work on Capsule Monsters. Yep. And they were a bit dismayed because they wouldn't be able to find programmers who had the same level of talent that would allow them to meet their commitments. And it was looking like um, Capsule Monsters might not become a reality. But Masuda had an idea. The programmers weren't coming back, but maybe he could just take over as a programmer. Even though he had mostly been focusing on music, he had also been studying programming in his spare time, and he had already been using the Capsule Monsters database as his reference. He pitches this to everyone else, and they discuss. And they're like, well, this is a bit of a long shot, but what choice do we have? So everyone left in the company agrees that Masuda would take over programming. It was the only reasonable way that they could move forward while they looked for more talent. And this all seems like it's working out really well at first. And then another disaster strikes. For some context, the workstations that they were using were called a SunSpark Station 1, and they all ran on the programming language Unix. Supposedly, these workstations were uh, well-known for crashing. They were quite prone to crashing, and they would do so pretty frequently. One day... Masuda is trying to reconstruct what the other programmers have been working on, and suddenly, the workstation crashes. Okay? Happens all the time. But the crash was so bad that they could not figure out how to recover the data on the workstation at all. Here is part of a longer quote that Masuda had to say about it. Quote, Somewhere midway through the development, maybe in the fourth year or so, we had a really bad crash that we didn't know how to recover the computer from. That had all of the data for the game, all of the Pokemon, the main character, and everything. It really felt like, oh my god, if we can't recover this data, we are finished here. I just remember doing a lot of different research. I called the company that I used to work for, seeing if they had any advice on how to recover the data. I would go on this internet service provider back then called NiftyServe. It's like a Japanese version of CompuServe. I'd go on and ask people that I'd never talked to for advice on how to recover the data. I would look at these English books about the machine itself because there wasn't a lot of information in Japanese just to figure it out. We eventually figured out how to recover it, but that was like the most nerve-wracking moment, I think, in development. How scary is that? Um, that, that is hyper scary. I have to t go like... Five minutes back because I didn't know when to when to go in. But uh, Unix is not a programming language. Unix is a multi-user um, operating system that most modern operating systems is based on. 
But that's not a problem. I just wanted to prevent Enamel from kicking your teeth in. in like <laughs> Thank you for the correction that I, uh, for the mistake <laughs> I had in my notes there. Um, no, no problem. Yes, no. Enamel, please don't kick my teeth. I need them. Um, I use them to eat. Um, yeah, so anyway. Yeah, that is hyper scary, man. Right? Shit. Four years of development. Um, also, uh, oh, you know, no. data redundancy, kids. You know, really important. Um, you know, I've lost stuff on PC crashes before. Everyone has, right? But that's just like a whole other magnitude. But yeah, they recovered it and pushed on. Very scary. Whew. So <laughs> with all of this going on, they start hiring people, okay? They want to act, like really push in to Capsule Monsters. And so I want to talk about some of the people that joined the team. They started to hire on as the team grew. Um, I'll mention a couple of them throughout the episode just so that I can put some more names in your hat. And as I just, uh, as I bastardize these names, uh, one hire of note was Atsuko Nishida, who was brought onto the team because Sugimori was having trouble drawing cute monsters. So she actually worked. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't draw cute stuff. <laughs> So they had to they had to get a woman so, to help them. So what do you stuff. what do you need me to come into the company for? I don't know. We need like cute monsters, but I I didn't apply. I, I applied as a programmer. No, we we just need cute monsters and you're a woman, so you kind of you kind of gotta know how this works, right? Yeah, I you must. I know have everything. no clue how to draw cute monsters. <laughs> well, of course you do. You're a woman. Oh, it's like that South Park episode, and then they give her a pen, and she actually draws cute stuff, and they're like, see. <laughs> You can do it. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah. Um, you know, I just, I hear these things sometimes and I'm like the fucking nineties, man. <laughs> like, it's just yeah. like, you know, they're just like, we can't draw cute shit. We have to get a woman to help us draw cute shit. Like just, Oh my God. <laughs> like, I won't be caught dead drawing cute shit. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. So anyway, um, Nishida, she worked on pulse man for a bit. And then they shifted her over um, to working on Capsule Monsters. Um, note, uh, the Capsule Monsters were originally based on like kaiju or dinosaur designs that stuff Ken Sugimori was into. So Nishida is trying to offer her perspective on what these monsters might look like. And I'm going to use the English names here, but she created yeah. the characters that we now know of as Pikachu, Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Charmander. So she did, did the- let me Let me give you the German names because those are different too. Bulbasaur is Bizazam. Squirtle is Shiggy, <laughs> and what you had you had Squirtle, Charmander, also, Pika, Charmander is uh, Glumanda. Oh, I like that. And Pikachu is Pikachu. <laughs> um, I have, and I think that's it. Yeah, Pikachu is just universal. I think. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah, there will be a lot of these. I'd love to hear the German name if you can think of them. Yeah, so. we can do the German ones too. <laughs> yeah. Um. So they had Nishida doing some of that work, but Sugimori says that everyone at the company would pitch in designs for monsters, and then he would like he was kind of like the final arbiter of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but Nishida she it created Pikachu. Um, the original. So just side thing about Pikachu, since we we can't escape, right? Pikachu's everywhere. He's on everything. Yeah. Let's, let's just talk about Pikachu. The original Pikachu design was made by someone else. It was done in pixel art, and it was based on a Japanese mochi cake called a daifuku. It had little ears on it. So, like, imagine, like, a little uh, mochi cake thing with, with ears. And she saw this and ditched that idea. She said that she was obsessed with squirrels at the time and came up with the idea of a creature that stored electricity in its cheeks. She revised it a few times, Ooh. right? So you got a squirrel. Squirrels, you know, right? They carry things around. And because also the cheeks sparkle when it starts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it. that she would draw it and they'd, she'd take it back to the team and they would tell her to make it cuter. And they just like this happened multiple <laughs> times. They'd be like, no, it needs to be cuter. It has to be cuter. And then you got the final Pikachu design. Um, Which is uh, the definition of cuteness. Yep. Fun fact, the name Pikachu comes from two things. If I'm wrong here, I'm sure my wife will correct me at some point. In Japanese, chu is the sound that a mouse makes when it squeaks. Pika is the word that they use to show that something is being zapped by electricity. It might also be used as glitter, like to glitter, sparkle, or shine. So uh, Pikachu. Pika is the zap sound, chu is the squeak sound, right? And that makes so much sense because it, it is just a thunder mouse, right? Yep. And its yeah. evolution, Raichu, Rai, comes from the word for thunder. Another fun fact, simply because you just can't escape Pikachu. Uh, did you know Pikachu was supposed to have a third evolution called Gorochu? 
I mean, it, it, it has a, a, a previous one that later got added, which is Pichu, right? But right. Then, but, like, Raichu should turn into Gorachu? You got it. Just, Goro oh. being the word for the sound of thunder. As she put it, quote, oh. it had fangs and horns and looked like a god of thunder. Um, that third evolution didn't make the cut due to some space limitations, something that we'll talk about later. And because the designers thought that there were too many Pokemon that already had three stages, they were like, we don't need this many. And, and it wouldn't have been like, how do you make something like that cute? Right. Yeah, so there's like a lot of fan art, and I know that at some point the design, uh, at least for the back of the character, got leaked in a big leak a few years ago. Oh. And so there's like some kind of an idea of what it might look like. Um, it was like a bit of a darker shade, and it looked a little more spiky. Um, like if you made Raichu look a little scarier. Um, but mm -hmm. um, no official. I mean, most that we third made. evolutions look like slightly scary versions of the young ones, right? Yeah. Yep, you got it. So, all right. So that's uh, that's Nishida. We got her out of the way. Uh, there was also Motofumi Fujiwara. Um, they joined the company in um, 1992, um, contributed a lot of character designs. The most famous creation that we know him for is the Pokemon Eevee. Ooh. He was trying to create a Pokemon that he thought would be a blank slate. He said that the design came to him from a time that he was lost in the woods as a kid, and he saw a creature in the woods he couldn't identify. So that's where he got the idea for Eevee. Eevee in German is Evoli, which is pretty close, I guess. Yeah, that is pretty close. Shigeru Miyamoto also deserves a mention. Uh, he was a producer on the games at the time. If you don't know Miyamoto, just know that he is quite possibly one of the most influential uh, figures in video game history. He was working as sort of a mentor to Tajiri at the time, and he was who Tajiri would go to uh, when he needed important things or guidance. So Shigeru Miyamoto. Another interesting person was Koji Nishino. He started off as an assistant, just doing like little things around the office that nobody else wanted to do. Like, so they'd have all these garbage jobs and they just like be like, ah, oh, just give it to Koji, right? Koji Nishino was a really big guy, supposedly. And he had a massive appetite as the story goes. And I guess it was known Is he like the main character from any anime that just kind of constantly <laughs> eats <laughs> and is huge and strong? Well, I guess it was known around the office that he liked eating food so much that he would like he was the guy that would eat things in the fridge that were covered in mold and he like didn't care. And so there are two conflicting stories here. In one, the office called him Kabi, which is the name for Kirby in japan in the other version of the story they called him kabi which is mold <laughs> okay dude i'm these these stories you're like every person <laughs> that ever got bullied anywhere knows how these things go <laughs> like he's a hungry guy and that's well known and he does eat a lot of things and one day something disappeared out of the, out of the fridge that was well known to be a little bit moldy he didn't mm -hmm. eat it <laughs> but the story was already made before anything else could be said. So I'm 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 not gonna keep calling in mold. It's not gonna happen. I'm team mold. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I so, see. I okay, see. so listen. Yeah. <laughs> so he's doing all the shitty jobs, he's getting made fun of. But the gist I got is that he like kind of enjoyed this. Um, but they I don't know. always say that the bullied that the bullied one enjoyed it. He we, we were having fun together. He the little guy. He was having fun too. It's not our fault. He was enjoying it. He wanted to eat the mold. We didn't make him eat the mold. <laughs> we did make him eat the mold. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I I am realizing a few things right now, and um, I can't say it makes me too happy, Tyler. <laughs> Well, we all know that he, uh, that Koji Nishino was happy to eat mold based on the facts of this story. So, uh, over time, <laughs> <laughs> over time, um, they stopped giving him shitty tasks to do and started giving him more important tasks to do. He was a I very, mean, because he was a really skilled worker. What the he fuck was. is going on? <laughs> 
<laughs> he was very knowledgeable about RPG mechanics and helped a lot with ironing those out. And this is not a side note. He was like in a conference room and he was like, you fucking assholes, you're going to treat me like a human being or I'm going to quit. And they started treating him like a human being because he started standing up for himself. That was what happened. <laughs> it's my headcanon and I think it's the truth. He had to tell them. You motherfuckers. <laughs> Stop calling me mold. Give me real jobs. <laughs> you listen here, mold. You'll take out the trash and do all the shitty coding jobs no one wants. <laughs> Eat another plate of mold, buddy. Okay, incredible. well, uh, apparently they were like, oh, this guy's incredibly talented. And uh, he, started, he started taking over <laughs> yeah. programming tasks, doing data administration, he turned into this like huge source of information and talent to the team. And in like, I've never read an interview where they talked about him that they didn't talk about how he just became completely indispensable to the team. Um, here's Tajiri quote. He started out as just a helper, but ended up becoming an indispensable part of the team. End quote. Uh, I guess I read something that he never took a day off of development or no, he only ever took a single day off from development. And when he did, all programming had to stop. They could not do it without him. And so, as a bit of a tribute to him, they made a Pokemon based on him. In the U.S. Oh, oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. We know of him as Snorlax. <laughs> but in Japan, Snorlax's name is Kabigon. Or in Germany, it's Relaxo, I guess. Yeah, he's called Relaxo, yeah, because he relaxes a lot. Which is equally great. Um, whatever your take is on the Kirby side. I even realized that he was indispensable. And what do they do? <laughs> they give him the fattest, filthiest animal do in the <laughs> whole Pokemon franchise do you? that sleeps all day and does nothing. Did he enjoy it? Was, is there like sources that he was like really happy he actually to really be was. featured in this game? <laughs> yeah, okay. He nice. says, quote, something to the, I'll, I, this isn't a direct quote I'm reading, but he says that he thinks of Snorlax as basically his child. And that he loves Snorlax. I think that's cool. Uh, I can. Do you want to know what the Gen I, One? Actually, Snorlax, I think, is my favorite Pokemon. One of my favorites. Yeah. Snorlax is my brother's po favorite Pokemon. I bought him a yeah. Snorlax series of pajamas, like a Kigurumi that has like the hood. Nah, and he, it was that's like cool. a full Snorlax thing. Um, do you want to know what the Pokédex entry reads uh, for Snorlax yeah. in Gen One? We'll eat anything. Even if the food happens to be a little moldy, <laughs> it never gets an upset stomach. <laughs> That's really cool to know, though. That's I. Okay, I'm I'm still a bit mad, but it's okay. I think that you have a completely fair take. But I, I had, I had to do the deep dive into. Wait, so they called this guy Mold? <laughs> like, that's really cool to know. So, um, but no, he he like literally said he loves Snorlax and he like thinks of it as like his child out there in the world. So, um, okay. I mean, it is really it is really important to the story too. In the first generation, mm -hmm. it it just stops you from getting to a very important part of the game because it just lies there and does nothing. Yeah. Yep, there were two other programmers as well. We don't need to go into much about them, but just to, to, to mention them, uh, uh, Takenori Uta, a programmer, and uh, Shigeki Morimoto. So there were two other programmers on the team. Now we've got our whole crew, okay? Yeah. I'm probably missing more people, but we have gotten an entire episode and now like 20 minutes of preamble in. Let's talk Pokemon. The setting for the games would be in a region called Kanto. Astute listeners might know that Kanto is an actual geographical region of Japan. Um, it's a real place. Here is Ishihara on why they picked it. Um, also, quick side note before I read this quote. I don't know that I say this directly in the episode, but the original iteration of Pokemon was that it was happening sort of in the real world and that Pokemon had just appeared in like on like Earth and that's why it was like, we got to figure out what the hell these critters are. Um, yeah. They moved away from that to make it its own setting later. But there's a, that's sort of why there was a little bit of overlap with real world places and events that are referenced in the first game. Uh, Ishihara and why they picked it. Quote, basically, it's a place with the ocean to the south, mountains to the north, and an area like Tokyo Bay where you can explore. If it were America, it'd be a place like Florida or a peninsula in California. 
We were searching for places like that. If you look at a map of the world, there are lots of places that fit the geographical description of the Pokemon world. Like an image that looks the same, even when you look at it from different angles, it looks like it could be anywhere in the world. So that was purposeful. So they tried to make something relatable. Yep. Yeah. That was that was purposeful. They talked about how they wanted the game to feel like it had themes and creatures that could just kind of exist anywhere. And so the area where Tajiri grew up would be the inspiration for the starting town. It's usually called Pallet Town um, when we reference it. Uh, and think yeah. of it, right? A boy setting off on his journey into the world just like he did, right? Um the world that they made would be connected by a series of roads that you could use to travel from town to town. They did this because that's how they like imagined it working in real life. Like you travel on big named roads to get to cities, right? And also because it meant that they did not have to fill in every inch of the map, which I thought was very smart. Yeah. So you take these roads, there's like ways that you can deviate from them, but you the whole world is out there, but you can't really get to it. Yeah. So let's talk art direction then. Interestingly, one of Ken Sugimori's roles was to make art of each Pokemon, but it was a bit of a process. How they would do this is when they came up with a Pokemon, they would create it within the game using pixel art. Then after they had made it in the pixel art, Sugimori would then go and draw it using his watercolor techniques. So if you think to that like first gen Pokemon, all those beautiful watercolors, he was doing that by looking at pixel art that was already in the game. That makes a lot of sense to do it that way, I think. And so to also make this design process even harder, they were working on a black and white monochromatic Game Boy at the time. So the Game Boy didn't originally have color, so all the sprites that they made of Pokemon had to work without color. And yeah. like they were just working with such a small number of pixels as well. And so like sometimes when we look back at the original sprites, it's interesting to think that he was looking at this like very low res pixel art and trying to think about how to draw that and flesh it out using watercolors and then his changes eventually became what the designs were and so it was sort of an iterative process, right? Yeah. I think what must have been the most difficult because there's always two sides from which you can like you have always a version of the Pokemon walking around, which often is the same for several Pokemon. Mm -hmm. But then within the battles, you have one version you see from the back and one you have to see from the front. And the one from the front always work great, but the ones you see from the back, sometimes you can't figure out what is what. It's a bit difficult. And I think that must have been the, the hardest ones to design. Yeah, I would bet. But um, I know that like... Later on in this story, um, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but I know that there were like, when Pokemon, you know, kind of blew up, there would be people who would be like, well, we want to make a toy of this. Uh, wh what does it actually look like? Right. And they'd be like, um, we've never actually drawn its tail before, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> things like that. And they have to like make these decisions. Right. And so they started getting better about creating art as things got better. Right. Um, it, or I guess not better, but more um, popular. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just thought that I would mention that like iterative process between pixel art to illustration to back to pixel art, whatever, because it explains a lot about the design inconsistencies of the early gens of Pokemon. So along the way, they are writing these little lore entries of what they called the Pokédex. Uh, I don't know that if it, if it had a name before that, but that was what eventually they landed on. Um, and they start realizing that it might be more fun for people to collect the monsters and that maybe they should break away from the traditional RPG that they had picked. And Sugimori said that, quote, instead of a hero defeating an evil villain, we decided a story about a kid traveling around to complete his Pokédex was more fitting for modern times. Yeah, there is a, there is a few villains, but they kind of are side characters, right? They do, you you defeat them along the way, but they don't really matter that much. Yeah, your your story matters more than their story, right? Beating them is is part of it, but no, your your attempt to become a Pokemon master, to become the champion, that's more important. They thought that was yep. that was purposeful. So, Tajiri has said in some interviews that the Pokédex was included for a few reasons. First, it was to push you to collect a bit. When you see blank spots in the decks, you wanted to know what they were. Further, the decks helped to give you a little bit of lore about each Pokemon so that you knew more about them in the game's world. 
And for the broad themes of the game, Tajiri drew from his own experiences. Here's a longer quote. Pokemon will always be about my childhood. I think adults and children see the world differently, so I wanted that to be reflected in the game. That's why in Pokemon, you never see things from the adult's perspective. When I was a kid, I really hated being called Squirt or Little Boy. Maybe that's how adults saw me, but I felt like I was more than just a kid. That's also a theme in Pokemon. That's why the protagonists in the games are on the same level as adults, even though they look down on them. But when you can defeat them in a battle, they start to view you differently. That happens a lot in the game as you gain recognition and continue to grow. That's all from my personal experience. And I later realized that's something all kids around the world experience. Yeah, like your opponents always trash talk you in the beginning and then they're like, either they double down or they... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or they um, get nice to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Oh, what? Beaten by a kid? <laughs> or, you know, like the, there'd always be like a pun, right? And it'd be like an artist. And then they'd be like, guess I better go back to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> Some dumb shit like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. But what of actual mechanics? Well, they experimented with a lot of ideas. The team talked about how because there wasn't actually a set deadline, right? Like their original goal, long gone. So because there was no set deadline in which the game needed to re be released, they could try to fit in as many good ideas as they could come up with. Here are some things. First, they considered an idea where if you lost a Pokemon battle, your opponent would take your Pokemon from you scrapped <laughs> because training up your Pokemon and losing them was found to be really rough on the player. It's just hyper frustrating. That's like yeah, yeah. Darkest Dungeon Pokemon Edition. No, that's worse. I mean, dark, yeah, I, no, I, 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 terrible. <laughs> it's good that they stopped that. Um, there was also a mechanic where you could buy and sell Pokemon for money. But Tajiri started having second thoughts about um, this game where the economy was based on exchanging money for living things. Oh, that's where you all had <laughs> second thoughts. But having like 10 year olds doing animal fighting, like literal cock fighting form, and they can earn money with that. That is okay. But no, selling them for a bit of money, that is, that is the line I draw. It's not cock I, fighting. I Pokemon are our friends. They do this because we're <laughs> friends and we want to. I just want to lightly skip ahead in the Pokemon lore and talk about how my favorite uh, villain group was the villains from the fifth gen who are animal rights, uh, like an animal rights liberation group who like want to liberate all Pokemon. And I was just like, wait, I fucking agree with these guys. <laughs> Can I join Can I team, them team Plasma or whatever it was? <laughs> like, No, we keep them in balls until they die. And then you have to beat the shit out of them to show them that that's what friends do. <laughs> <laughs> and you force them to reproduce <laughs> yeah you got like 600 eggs you don't need them toss them out release them <laughs> yeah okay oh my gosh okay so he had he had scruples about certain things he did yeah um, and not about others the, they were also um running into some programming roadblocks having like monetary values attached to every pokemon and this like whole concept of like some Pokemon were worth more than others. I mean, that that would have been its own its own game, a, a whole Pokemon money trading economy. Yeah, yeah. Um, another part of development, they tried having the main character fight Pokemon alongside their partners. So, like, <laughs> imagine you're out there just like punching the shit out of Bulbasaur <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> so, like, you step on a how's the little caterpillar Caterpie? called? Um, or Weedle. You gotta be, and, you, and you just smash it and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they ditched that idea. Um, that didn't really stick. <laughs> um, and they were also like, wait, this kind of makes the Pokemon themselves irrelevant. Like, if we just wanted Kaiju Slapper, we could have done that, right? <laughs> if we just want, like, the, the trainers could just start going to town on, e on each other instead of letting their Pokemon fight. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I guess I hadn't considered that. Sudden, you get into a fist uh, fight with the, your trainer opponent. like All of a sudden, you have Street Fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Street Fighter Pokemon Edition. But with 10-year-old <laughs> kids, yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> one of the biggest ideas that Tajiri had, he had this notion that everyone should be playing their own story. 
So he wanted to assign everyone a trainer number, and depending on the number that was generated, your game would change ever so slightly. It would alter what Pokemon appeared in the game, what locations looked like, and how you could even approach like puzzles and tasks and stuff. So... That would have been a sick, but that's impossible to implement at the time. Right? So based on all the valid trainer numbers that they created, there would be 65,535 different versions of the game, all with very slight differences. As you might imagine, Tajiri had some trouble figuring out how to implement this and how they would pitch it to consumers. So he goes to Shigeru Miyamoto, his mentor, and they talk about it. Quote, I talked to Miyamoto about how we'd make players understand that every cartridge is different when they buy one. And he told me the system sounded interesting, but it was a bit difficult to grasp. He said if players can't tell just by looking at it, then it won't work out, and it would be better if the game's color or appearance were different. I was shocked I was even allowed to do that. I told him it would really help me out if I could. So, it was from trying to differentiate ID numbers that the idea to symbolically change the colors came about. And that's how they made the binary games, right? It's always two games. It's never just one. Yeah. I always thought they did that out of greed. Well... I never thought that there was another background. I, I mean, they, of course, they did it because of greed. But I, I like that there at least is a spark of something else in there, that there's some 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 kind of ambition you know that it it was supposed to be something good and grand and of course then it was monetized to the max but yeah yeah so i agree i always thought it was a marketing gimmick um so they they basically they decided they would make two different cartridges red and green both versions would be parallel but have some differences like what pokemon you could find and stuff um but i did a little bit of digging and miyamoto had this to say about the 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 two cartridge thing Quote, I didn't suggest splitting the games because it would allow us to sell more copies of the same thing. I just thought it would be more fun for the players if, say, there were three siblings and they all owned something unique. That way, they'd be able to communicate. I didn't want to release separate versions of the games just to increase the marketability. End quote. I think it really wouldn't have that much. I don't know if it did. I, I, I don't know the numbers. Mm-hmm. But I know that me and my friends, which is, of course, anecdotal, but me and my friends, one person always just had one game. Mm-hmm. Though I knew people that had both, I am unsure. I know some people who buy both versions when when a new Pokemon gen hits, but uh, I would say it's probably not the norm to buy them both. Um, but again, I don't have numbers on that either. I can think of like yeah. one or two people I know who do that, and most everybody else just buys one. Um, and then they trade with each other. Hmm. I don't know. Don't have numbers on it, but well, they did go really hard into the trading aspect of the games, which is, you know, what uh, Nintendo really liked about it. Miyamoto said in a video that one of his biggest contributions was his work in setting up trading with other players through the link cable. So he really did a lot of that. And this trading gimmick was supposed to be pretty central. It's why there are some Pokemon that only evolve when they're traded. Yeah. Because they wanted people to be trading everything. They wanted there to be incentives to meet up with other people in the real world and trade Pokemon with them. I should also note that Masuda uh, and some others have said that they didn't explicitly make Pokemon for children, but they did want something that was kid accessible. So they wanted to make it so that all kinds of people could be drawn into the game for their own reasons. Maybe the adults would care about the story or the battling. You know, kids might want, um, you know, a cute Pokemon or collecting, right? It was just supposed to have something for everybody in it. And at the beginning of the game, you are given the choice between three different Pokemon. Of course, yes. Again, I'll use the US names, right? Bulbasaur, a grass type. Charmander, a fire type, and Squirtle, a water type. They were specifically chosen to be sort of a rock, paper, scissors kind of thing, so that no matter which one you chose, each would be weak against one and strong against the other. And they added in the idea of like types and move types during development as a way to add complexity. That might be true, but uh, still, if you pick Bulbasaur, you're an idiot. Excuse you? <laughs> I, I, Excuse to you. To be fair, I always pick Bulbasaur, but I know that people online <laughs> get really mean <laughs> if you do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Bul- Bulbasaur has always been my, my favorite starter. I don't know why. Uh, I was a Charmander kid. Yeah. Um, cause who wasn't, I right? think most, most were, yeah. Um, 
Figuring out which moves a Pokemon could use was a big task. Masuda joked in an interview that he thought that figuring out the moves probably took half of their lengthy design time. And Pokemon could use lots of moves, but they could only fit four moves on the screen at the time using the font that they were using for the game. So they decided that instead of making a giant list of moves that you had to scroll through, that you would have to think tactically about which moves you wanted your Pokemon to have. This was also a way that your Pokemon could be unique compared to someone else's. You both might have the same Pokemon, you and a friend, but you would have different moves. Yeah. One thing to note, I did a replay of Yellow about a year ago, maybe a little more. And one thing that really drove me nuts is that you have no idea what the moves do unless you buy a guide. There was no room on the cartridge to put that info. You just see the name, right? You just see the name. Yeah. That's it. That's, and you have to just experiment. That was kind of the... But it does drive you crazy at times. But it also, I think, when it came out in the 90s, it was also kind of the appeal of the... You have to communicate with your friends to figure this game out. Yeah. But you could still... It, it added a little bit of mystery. It does, but you can still waste like some good TMs just on not knowing and just trying it out. So, I don't know. Yep. So speaking of the uh, space constraints that I've mentioned a few times, they really affected a lot of the development process. I read so many interviews where they talked about just how much they had to optimize to fit things onto the cartridge. Here's a longer quote from Masuda from a Games Radar article. Quote, It was difficult. The thing that we wanted to focus on at the start was communication and trading, but it was difficult to do that as we could only transfer small amounts of data between two consoles. He explains, communication itself was a big challenge. The technology just wasn't there, but we really wanted to do it. So we fought to get it in there. That was an overriding theme. It was a fight against capacity, a fight against what we could fit onto the cartridge. We had designed these 150-odd Pokemon to get in as well, but then we had the problem of movement. So we came up with the idea of the map tiles being the things that moved while the character was animated in place. With these ideas, we found ways to squeeze as much in as we possibly could. I like the Game Boy as a machine, but trying to work with all these challenges and make a game that anyone could get into and and enjoy was difficult. But in the end, it probably made the game better because if you keep reducing something to its essential parts, you either screw up or it becomes the essence of its best parts. I totally agree. Um, Sugimori had a quote on this too, quote, it's a small screen and low storage space. So we had to avoid being wasteful to the best of our abilities. The Pokemon sprites were no exception. We couldn't use a lot of pixels to show all the details and we couldn't use many colors either. So we made sprites that were easy to understand and symbolized more complex designs. I think that's why as a result, Pokemon were so well received by a wide range of people. Yeah. Yeah. So you pretty much hit that right on the head there, Docs. As the game neared the end stages of development, it started shaping up into the RPG that many of us who have played it remember. You're a kid going out on your first Pokemon adventure. You have to capture and train Pokemon, battle your way through the game, defeating leaders of Pokemon gyms, and getting their badges. Eventually, you would fight the final trainers of the Pokemon League and try to become the champion. But the battle system was, as people have sort of mentioned already, a bit of a sticking point. Tajiri was big on having battles be the focus of the game, but the rest of the team wasn't as interested in it. Uh, Shigeki Morimoto said that they thought it would be a real pain to program the battles, but then Nintendo started saying they wanted battles in the game as well, so they dug deeper into like really fleshing out the combat system. And I just want to say, like before I move on, I read this in a couple of interviews and I found this really weird that they're like, ah, I don't know about this battling thing. It seems like a big hassle. Why should we do this? Right? Like, because it's so essential to the game, right? right? Like the whole fucking point of the game was to make a kaiju battle game and they've been working on it for years. And then there's pushback. Why? I just did not understand. And also it is a good battle system. They did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, the whole type, is. the whole thing about different types that do more damage to other stuff, and the certain types work with certain attacks and things. It's simple but complicated, just the way a good battle system has to be. I totally agree. Um, 
the first pass that they made of the battle system, I found this fascinating. You would send your Pokemon into battle, and then you as the player had no interaction with the game. You would just watch the two monsters mm, battle it out. An auto battler. It was an auto battler on the Game Boy. Mm. They also were trying to stay away from numbers during the battle scenes. Uh, and the attacks would say things like, Nidoran poked you with its horn. It didn't seem to hurt that much. But like eventually they were like, eh, maybe we do need numbers and then put numbers in. And they, they were keeping this like auto battler thing for a while. They sent it to Nintendo. Nintendo did some like focus group testing. And the survey said that the battle system was really boring. And so after that, they're like, maybe we do need some of these more traditional RPG elements of like picking attacks, right? From my experience, I've, I, I'm a person that likes auto battlers. But from my experience, that is rare. <laughs> yes. Pe like most people I know wouldn't enjoy it because it's a passive kind of playing the game you you come up with a plan beforehand and then you watch it unfold and it if if it fails it's really frustrating because you can't even do anything about it and yeah. if it if it works out this it still doesn't feel satisfying because you didn't interact during the whole thing i think yeah for me the only auto battler that i've ever played that stuck out to me was loop hero i really liked loop hero um, oh yeah um, also while we're getting to this, like, um, uh, while we're just digging into battling, they weren't even going to include link battles in the beginning. You were only going to use the link for trading, but those came along near the end as they were like crunching to meet their deadline. And I'm so glad they put them in. Cause I think it's like really integral to Pokemon in my whole life. I never did a link battle. I've done a couple. Um, well, I've not done one in the original game boy because I played them years after they were relevant but i've done like battles against other people in real life I've, I've always had friends that were smarter than me so when if i would have done link battles i would have gotten really humili humiliated <laughs> in pokemon a lot so i think i might have just avoided that yeah i used to occasionally go on back in the day and just like find random opponents to fight online and that was kind of fun for a little while until you get like ah, yeah. somebody who's just got like a literal turtle that they've buffed up and you can't do anything about it and you spend like 45 mm -hmm. turns trying to hurt it until you hurt yourself oh, people people that purposefully waste your time that's also oh yeah awesome. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so i couldn't find a good source here to give me a timeline so i figured that this was just a good time to put this in here i guess that tajiri went to copyright the name capsule monsters and it was already taken so not undeterred, right? No. Capsule Monsters now. He changed the name to Capumon, which was a shortened version of Capsule Monsters. But the general consensus was that was terrible and it didn't really stick. So they started calling the game Pocket Monsters. And then the shortened version of Pocket Monsters was Pokemon. There we are. So, and that even inspired like a whole batch of other games and other franchises that just kind of copy the suffix mm -hmm. and just add something else in front, right? This Digimon comes to mind. Did, did Digimon being the most obvious and the, I think the the biggest competitor at the time, um, though it is dead now. Um, but we're gonna get yeah. hate mail for you saying that. I'm I'm a huge Digimon fan. I I always liked Digimon more than Pokemon, but I think I got into that before. But um yeah. Yeah, I think this this name is one of those names that then inspires other names. Like I agree. Uh, um, uh Watergate. <laughs> yeah, like what, what a good what a good reference there. Yeah. Yeah, like Watergate. Yep. Yeah. How everything is something gate but yeah okay um the team continued to grow near the end of development they had 20 people at the company nine of them working on pokemon 11 of them working at other projects but before they finished the team was running into difficulties fitting the full 200 pokemon that they had planned onto the cartridge i read somewhere that just due to memory constraints pokemon in the japanese version could only use five japanese characters to name them and they had to be creative in naming to fit those constraints one of the biggest issues that they ran into was the nickname system 
First, they thought about letting players name every species they discovered, but then they were like, well, we're hitting limitations on what the Game Boy can actually do. So they decided on nicknaming individual monsters, but implementing nicknames was taking up a ton of space in the memory. So they had to make hard decisions. If they kept the nickname system on the current hardware, they could only have 30 Pokemon on the cartridge. They did internal polling. The team agreed that they thought having nicknames was so integral to Pokemon that it was more important than the game having monster variety. They weren't sure what to do. So Tajiri, yet again, looks to his mentor, Miyamoto. He understood, Miyamoto understood what they were trying to do. And Miyamoto convinced the executives at Nintendo to increase the size of the backup memory for the cartridge by some accounts quadrupling the size. Now, this was not enough to fit all 200 Pokemon, but it was enough to fit a lot of them on. I don't know, In maybe early, around 150. Something like that. <laughs> Uh, they would ask internally, like they release early versions of the game, you know, they'd let people in the company play it. They'd say, which were your favorites? They picked, you know, they, that's how they trimmed on popular Pokemon. They did Pokemon from their sudden death and then only the strongest yeah. survived. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know if some of those that got thrown out made it into later games? Some of them and some of their designs did, but a lot of them were just kind of scrapped oh. like ones that weren't particularly useful. Um, uh, they were unpopular for a reason. So, um, but they ended up fitting 150 on the cartridge. That's what they finalized. They made cuts, including trimming down some of the multi evolution lines of that Meowth, Vulpix, Goldeen, Ponyta, Zubat, and Psyduck all lost one of their evolutions. Oh, they were all supposed to have a third evolution and they don't due to space constraints. But they, those are all Pokemon where I'm like, it's fine how they worked out. So that's good. Yeah, I think they're fine. Uh, I think some of them might have been like mid evolutions as um, well, like an in because between. Because all the, all right? the final so ones like, feel so perfect as the final one. So maybe, yeah, but there's like, maybe if they had a middle part. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the game was supposed to have three save slots, but they couldn't make that fit. It was that or nicknames. Nicknames were more important. Um, and if the stories are to be believed, uh, cutting po some of the Pokemon is part of the reason that there is an interesting glitch in the code. So originally they built the game uh, with slots in the code for up to 256 Pokemon, placeholder slots, like if you will, that they could fill in. However, only 150 in the game at the time. This created a glitch if you did a series of events. First, you would go to the northern part of Viridian City and watch the old man's demonstration on how to catch a Pokemon. Then you would fly to Cinnabar Island. Then you would surf. You would surf up and down the east coast of the island until a glitched out Pokemon named Missing No would appear. Missing No looks like a big scrambled block or like maybe like a garbled L. Missing No means missing number. Missing No. Okay, if you did this due to the spaghetti code, it would increase the quantity of the sixth item in your inventory by 128. Which, if it was the master you ball, could also catch. which could like could come in pretty handy. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, that does sound I like something someone would I might have used that glitch quite a lot when I was a very young child. <laughs> this is like the most <laughs> important first generation glitch. Everybody knows that. It is. I knew somebody, I never did it myself, but I knew somebody who did uh, rare candies. Yeah. They, would, they would dupe rare candies. So they I never liked to do it with rare candies faster. because um, I, I kind of thought that if you level them up with rare candies, they don't get as strong as if you do it by training. Some of that is true. Um, <clears throat> there are hidden values in the Pokemon games called um, yeah. uh, effort values, and you get them from battling other Pokemon, and in later games you can get them other places too. Those max out at some point, and so if you knew how to count those and max them out, then you could level them the rest of the way with rare candies, but you are mostly right. Um, so that's missing no. You could also catch missing no, but then it would start glitching out your game pretty hard. And Yeah, don't catch it. It is my personal belief, and I, you could fight me in this, that this is the most famous video game glitch of all time. 
I don't know what metric you could use to do this, but that's my take. I think you're not, you're not right. I think the most well-known glitch in video game history is I'm, I'm trying to think of something better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know. I never glitch abused in any other game right? as much as I did in Pokemon mm -hmm. because it was such a useful glitch that was relatively simple to do. Yep. So I tried to find a better one out of spite, but I, I wasn't able to. That's my take. Willing, willing to be uh, disagreed with, but... <laughs> okay. The game's code was finalized and was supposed to go out for printing. But at the last moment, uh, Shigeki Morimoto, the team member who was working on the battle mechanics, noticed that once he removed the debug features from the game... There were 300 bytes of free space left on the cartridge. He took it upon himself to sneak one more Pokemon onto the cartridge. Mew. This Mew. brought the total to 151, though you could not access Mew directly by legitimate means. More on that later. It's important. So he slides Mew. Wait, they edit Mew after they edit Mew too? They did, Mew didn't make the cut. So Yes. What? But that, so, I mean, Mew is in the story. Mm -hmm. So, because Mewtwo, I think it's explained in the story that Mewtwo originated from Mew, mm -hmm. but they were like, they cut Mew out and were like, we're just going to keep it in the law, but it's not going to be in the game anymore originally. And then he just put it back yes, in. Yes, he snuck it back That's in right it at the end. Uh, it, so it was only supposed to be a lore Pokemon, but it, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. At that point. Okay. So finally, after many hours of podcast, by October 1995, the game was ready. They sent it to Nintendo, who then added the games to their official release schedule. Now, around this time, Ishihara takes a bit of a different role in this story. Up until now, we have heard about him uh, helping the team in a few ways. He was a producer on Red and Green, and he had been working at Ape Incorporated, but his time there was ending. That company was kind of coming apart. People were starting to leave. Now, Ishihara, Ishihara is all in on the idea of Pokemon. He had been from the beginning. What he was also into was board games and card games. In his mind, Pokemon would be a perfect fit for a card game. You already have collectible creatures. The game is turn-based. You choose which monsters you want to fight with. It seemed like making a card game spinoff would be a hit. Note that Magic the Gathering, regarded as perhaps the first trading card game, was still in its infancy, and apparently Ishihara got a hold of some English versions of Magic cards which he used to do research. Ishihara decides that he is going to put together a new company with some of the former members of Ape Incorporated, and they call the company Creatures. Creatures Incorporated. The details here are a little hazy. But this is what we know what creatures did for Pokemon. First, Ishihara is the one who pushed for the Pokemon TCG to become a thing. And before the, po the, the first Game Boy games were even out, he had started development. Much of the art in the base set um, was from illustrations that had been done by Ken Sugimori, since he was already drawing the Pokemon anyway. And at some point in development, Game Freak was having trouble making it to the finish line financially. They were almost there but they needed another push. Creatures made a deal with Game Freak. They would give a cash infusion into Game Freak, and in exchange, Creatures would get a share of Pokemon's profits and also be involved in much of the licensing of outside products. Game Freak agrees. They need the money. As we might guess, that was a pretty good return on investment for creatures. More on that soon as well. But this is when that happens. This, this tie. Ishihara makes his own company. Okay. And then becomes, you know, intertwined with Pokemon even more. Yep. Leading up to the release, there was worry from within Nintendo that the game would not sell well. The Game Boy was in its twilight years. You were starting to see Game Boys less and less at the time. The console was seven years old. Um, also, there was a bit of talk that maybe the video game boom in Japan was over. Tajiri had a story about it. Quote, I was at a barber shop once and someone asked, so you're making a game? What kind of game? 
when I told them it's for the Game Boy, this guy I didn't even know said, the Game Boy? You're a bit late on that one. (laughs) Ishihara similarly once said that he was worried that they had, quote, missed the last train regarding interest in Game Boy. Um, Fun side note before we get into the release. If you know the Pokemon Porygon is an in-game reference to everyone who told Tajiri that he needed to ditch Pokemon and start making Polygon games for the next consoles. Like 3D stuff. Like 3D stuff. You got it. Yeah. Um, People would even tell him, well, you know, you need to make Polygon graphics on the Game Boy. And he's like, that's impossible. Right. So he put Porygon (laughs) in the game as a bit of an ironic statement. Yes, yeah, so a, 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 a little fuck you. Like I, I did it. <laughs> Here you go, bud. Now leave me, and now leave me alone. I'm counting my money. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, dawn of the final day. Pokemon Red and Green both release in Japan on February 27th of 1996. It had taken six years for the team to complete it and see it on shelves. Nintendo sent 200,000 copies that they had printed to the Japanese market. In their eyes, this would be a one-time product. It would have relatively limited appeal. It would be a fun little gimmick game on an aging system. That would be that. Yeah, it would probably kill the Game Boy. Like, let's let's just try it one more time, but then we'll just bury it. Yep, it'll just be another random thing that we can toss in with all our other strange peripherals we tested out, and that'll be that. Yeah, we gotta we, we gotta invest somewhere, right? Yeah. At first, there really wasn't much out there about it. February is not a great time of year to release games, at least in in the 90s. Um, There wasn't much media coverage. And then the game started to spread through word of mouth. It gained a small following in Japan. And stores started to order more copies. Now, in some interviews, there has been some talk that the game needed a jolt to take off. Some kind of thing that would make people excited about it. Remember how I told you that Mew had put on, been put on the cartridge in the last minute? Mew yeah. is mentioned in the game, as you noted, Docs, as being found in the jungle. And of course, Mew 2 is in the game, but the original Mew was never meant to be found. The team had left it in there in case they ever wanted to use it later, but there was no plans to do so. Now, because of some glitches, Mew is actually obtainable in the game. It is very rare, but your game can glitch out and it can happen. So a rumor began... There is a part of the game where if you go to a ship called the SS Anne, it is in a place where it is moored. The point is, uh, like in at the point of view as the character in that game is you go to that ship for part of the story. You do some stuff on the ship, the ship leaves. But across the water is a small piece of land with a random truck on it. The rumor that was going around was that if you got to that truck, you could find Mew. Mew was under the truck. Further right like there were people in the world who had accidentally glitched the game and had found mew very rare like i said but so there were more mews running around than you would expect and those furthered the rumor and it spread so quickly even i heard the mew under the truck rumor as a kid yeah i heard that too. right yeah i was skeptical because i had never seen one but i had heard the mew rumor kids then started contacting nintendo and asking about mew Nintendo had not been aware that an extra Pokemon had been put onto the cartridge. They started talking internally on what to do, but Tajiri, never the brains of the operation, has an idea. Why don't they just formally unveil Mew in a promotion? This would generate hype. It would also help to dispel a lot of the rumors around Mew, and this turned into a great promotion opportunity. In Koro Koro Magazine, they ran a promotion in May of 1996. You could send them an application. They would pick 20 people randomly. If you won, you would send them your cartridge, and they would unlock Mew for you. This generated a ton of buzz. 78,000 people sent in an application to get Mew. This also, this advertisement, made people pick up the game who wouldn't. Sales shot up. They sold more games in a week than they had in the previous month. In later remakes, by the way, they like remade this uh, portion of Kanto a few times. You can get to the truck and then they always stick an item under it. Like a weird random item as sort of an homage that there's like something there but it's not you right 
<laughs> so one of the things that Nintendo kind of worried about, like, oh no, there's this thing and it's causing, it might cause PR. It actually helped them in the end because the Game Boy had been out so long as well. They were everywhere, right? So they were. It was a well established uh, console. Right? Yes. They were worried about that too. So they were like, oh no, no one's going to want to play this on an old console. And people will be like, oh, I've got a Game Boy. Sure. I'll pull it out of storage, right? Um, yeah, we, 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 I know that we bought a Game Boy just for Pokemon. That is a common occurrence. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I bought my 3DS just so I could play Pokemon games on it. Still even, you know, in, yeah. in old Tyler land. Um, I don't, I actually don't know that I've ever played another game on that console other than a Pokemon game. So yeah, Game Boys are everywhere. You can get one cheap. They're an old console. And that was something that really helped. Uh, Koro Koro Magazine started covering the game heavily, and people started catching on. It spread fast. Within three months, over a million cartridges had sold. It was portable. You had this thing with you. You could use it to interact with other people in their game in the world. Your Pokemon had your trainer ID on it, so people could keep track of who had given them specific Pokemon. Then you combine that with battling, the differences in how you train them, the moves, all the stuff we talked about. Everybody who played had something different to bring, and suddenly there's this massive group of people who are all out there who are all in on it. And Nintendo realizes they have something on their hands. So they reach out to a company called OLM Incorporated to create a partnership to produce a Pokemon anime. The story, much like the games, was about a 10-year-old boy going on an adventure to become a Pokemon master. Uh, what is the main character called in Germany? He's called Ash Ketchum, too. Is he? Yeah. Okay. He's called Ash Ketchum in the US, but in Japan, his name is Satoshi. Oh. <laughs> Literally after Satoshi Tajiri, his rival, Gary, is Shigeru in Japan, which is a nod to his mentor, yes. Shigeru Miyamoto. Oh, that's so right? cute. For all the help you've yeah. done. Isn't that super cute? Yeah. Now, you might be wondering why we mentioned Pikachu a couple times earlier. Why did Pikachu get such a focus? Well, the team had decided that the game needed a mascot. And in a lot of the early advertising, it was actually Clefairy that got all of the advertising mm, yeah. uh, put toward it. Um, but when they started working on the anime, OLM started thinking more broadly. They wanted a mascot that would be appealing to everyone. Kids and parents, boys and girls. Something that would be instantly recognizable and unique. Plus... Pikachu was yellow and would immediately stick out. Yeah. And in their focus testing, they did focus testing. They found that Pikachu had a high appeal. So he became the mascot of the anime and the mascot of the games going forward. And because Pikachu became the focus of the anime, it gave Pikachu appeal in the games and in other places that it would not normally have. Pikachu is as important of a franchise symbol as for example, Mario would be, which makes it fascinating since Nintendo apparently has two of those very famous figures, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything comparable to how well-known Pikachu is. I am unsure. Maybe Mario. Maybe mm, not Sonic. Sonic is recognizable, but not like it's Pikachu not is. It's not Pikachu. To, Pikachu is big. I'd have to think Pikachu is bigger than Pokemon, too. I would agree with that, too. Yeah. Yep. Even if you don't know Pokemon, you usually know Pikachu. Yeah. Insane. Interesting. Have to think on that. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was that that was a pick by the anime company to pick something that would be instantly recognizable and massively like have massive appeal. I mean, and that basically inspired Pokemon Yellow, right? Because in Pokemon Yellow, you then get Pikachu as a starter, and yep, that's that was inspired by the anime because that was Ash Ketchum's Pokemon. You got it. Yep. Uh, we'll we'll touch on that here in a minute, but yep, I, that's your. I really right. loved Ash's and Pikachu's relationship because in the beginning, Pikachu fucking hates Ash so much, mm -hmm. just wants him to die and wants to be left alone. But Ash is such a moral mo moron that will not stop mm -hmm. harassing Pikachu. That at some point they got friends. I guess Pikachu got Stockholm mm -hmm. syndrome at some point. So. Yeah, the slapstick comedy of the first season, the first couple of seasons is pretty good. It's <laughs> just so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The card game. So the only games that have hit so far are just red and green. Okay. 
Um, the card game finishes development and hits the Japanese market in October of 1996. So about a year after they finished the first game, um, what, eight months or whatever after the games drop. Through a partnership with Koro Koro, the first cards were distributed through the magazine and given away for free. What a great way to do that. Hey, kid. Have you first taste, kid. What a tie hey, up crack. <laughs> hey. Trading cards. You can buy more I've these. wasted so mm. much of my money. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's really hard, too, because I fucking love trading card games. They scratch an itch in my brain that I can't get other places. And I was at a I was at a retro game store recently. Um, you probably saw in the Discord I posted that picture of Adventure that I had found. Um, and I was in there, and we saw, like, Pokemon cards, and my fucking lizard brain, like, lit up. And I was like, I need to buy these right now. I yeah, I I, I have now. addiction problems as well if it comes to trading cards. One thing I gotta get I gotta give credit to Pokemon cards, especially since he apparently did get inspiration from Magic cards. But what mm -hmm. I always despised about, for example, what later came Yu-Gi-Oh cards, was that they were just a cheap ripoff of Magic cards because the system is basically the same, just that all the yeah. numbers are thousands instead of um, decimals. And Pokemon is its own game; it's different, and I like that. Yeah, they, they came up with their own system, and I have some respect for that. I do think that the system is terrible, and nobody should play Pokemon <laughs> as a card game because it's it's it it doesn't it doesn't make any sense, and it's boring, and it takes it takes too long, and I don't get it. Uh, but uh, yeah, fine if you enjoy it. Docs is trying to save you from spending six thousand dollars of yours or your parents' money on uh, every single Pokemon card that you can possibly ever get your hands on. Because don't it... don't buy trading cards, kids. <laughs> don't don't even get started. <laughs> trading cards, not even once. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, easy to pick up, easy to play. Uh, they added these like addition in of like. Slightly more rare holographic cards. Those are popular. Kids went fucking bonkers for it. They went crazy. They spent all of their hard-earned pocket money. Yeah. Yep. And so Nintendo is like, we need to take this phenomenon globally. The president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, was pushing Game Freak to create new localizations. But there were issues. There were problems in the game's code. And because of this, it would be very difficult to translate the games out of Japanese. And here is a story, um, or, or at least the part of the story, where we bump into another famous figure from Nintendo history. We mentioned him a little in the first uh, part of this episode, Satoru Iwa Iwata. Um, Iwata, at the time, was president of HAL Laboratory, which was a developer with close ties to Nintendo. Iwata apparently dug through the source code for the entire game, and decided that they would have to create a brand new version of Pokemon if they were going to export it from Japan. The team gets to work on this. After several months, they finish up what would become Pokemon Blue. They updated all the sprites to the game. They fix a, fix a bunch of bugs. And some of the artists talked about how being forced to update the game, they had to reconcile with their previous designs for some of these critters. And they were mildly embarrassed with their sprite work. Um, some of the sprites had been made like six years previous. Yeah. Uh, and so at a casual glance, I dug through a lot of these. The new sprites were so much better. And those are the ones that they used in the international release. Um, and so a lot of the old sprites and bugs and just general jank was never seen outside of Japan. Because when they looked toward the international market, they wanted to use the more polished version. So blue became yeah. the template that they used going forward. So they get blue to Nintendo. Nintendo starts printing it, but Nintendo is still hesitant. For some reason, they're like, I don't know about this Pokemon thing. I don't know. So they don't do a full release of Blue in Japan. They only wanted to do as many copies of the game as they needed. So again, they partner with Koro Koro Magazine, and they decide that they're going to let people purchase Pokemon Blue through the magazine. It worked like this. You would fill out an application form that you would find in the magazine, you would then attach that form to a postcard. You would send the postcard to Koro Koro in the mail. And then they could get an idea of how many games to produce. And then they would send you Pokemon Blue in the mail, getting it sometime in December of that year. But what was really weird, if you're missing something here, is that they would just send you a game 
and you were on the honor system to then pay them for it. That's oh uh, man. Only way you like, can get Pokemon Blue in Japan. That is so until weird. like three years later. Like two parts of it, like the whole paper trail thing, which gives me. I think there's like the, it's it's a commonality I heard between Germans and Japanese that we like our paper trails, and this is a thing that was very common in Germany too to send to fill out these applications to send somewhere. Mm. So I'm getting slight flashbacks here, um, but also the honor system. Uh, I've never encountered something like that. People, I I I, I do not see companies trusting anyone <laughs> and for yeah. anything anymore you always have to pay ad right mm -hmm. yeah very strange to me so um yeah I, that was the only way you could get pokemon blue in japan um until it fully released like three years later crazy to me Amazing. um and what's weird is the team themselves didn't even really know how well the game was doing um here's masuda on it quote we weren't getting tons of reports from Nintendo about how well it was selling. We could see people out in the parks playing Game Boys and exchanging Pokemon. Every time we would go to a store, it was always sold out no matter how long time went on. Uh, it was about a year after the game came out that we really started to realize it was turning into something pretty big. So like even they didn't know at the time how big it was. I mean, how to how to grasp such a scale if you do not have the hard statistics? Right. Like, this is the scale that you cannot comprehend if you don't get, like, uh, systematically collected numbers. So it, how should they have grasped it? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, unless and Nintendo wasn't telling them, right? So the Pokemon anime releases in Japan on April 1st of 1997. The animation was not particularly high budget, and it does kind of show in some of the early episodes. But the stories were easy to follow, and kids latched onto it. Soon, the anime was the highest rated kids show in Japan. There was one big issue that came from the show, though. It is now what we call the Pokemon Shock. In the 38th episode of the anime, Ash and his friends run into Porygon, and through a series of events... Pikachu uses his Thundershock on some of Porygon's cyber missiles. In the resulting animation, the screen quickly flashed between red and blue. What happened is that several hundred children were reported to have had seizures or convulsions as a direct result of this episode, which then spread to mass hysteria surrounding the show. The aftermath was intense. Nintendo's stock price dropped. It ended with the show going on a four-month hiatus, and many episodes were edited to reduce the instance of flashing lights, including the opener. The original Porygon episode has never aired again officially in any country, nor has the anime ever focused on Porygon again. I know that this whole anime has too much flashing lights and causes kids to have seizures was not only a meme for the following decade just because of this, but parents were literally concerned to let their children watch any kind of Japanese television. Yep. I wasn't allowed to watch Dragon Ball without my mom because she read something um, where, um, where this happened. So it's interesting to see the origin of this because now I understand where it comes from. Yep. Oh, well. I don't want to, um, like, hmm, how do I put this? Uh, I think that probably there were some actually real uh, problems that came from this. Um, yeah, and that some children likely. actually experienced these things. I would also say that the mass hysteria surrounding it was uh, really, really overblown. I don't know that I truly subscribe to this theory, but there have been some that suggested that the publicity that Pokemon got around the world, I mean, you ran into it in Germany, um, from the shock is actually one of the reasons that it was localized to other countries. Like the idea of bad publicity still being publicity, right? So the team starts hearing about how successful this game is. And with all the success, Tajiri is just floored. They keep telling him that they need to make another Pokemon game. But in some interviews that I read, he was basically like, well, wait, I, 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 I made Pokemon. I did it. It's done. I, I expect it to be done. The first one took me six years, man. Right? <laughs> I can't do it again. Please don't make me do it again. 
But the head of Nintendo Public Relations, a man named Yoshio Hongo, really pushed Tajiri to make a follow-up game. So Tajiri agrees. And they discuss... <laughs> really pushed? Did he send goons to his house and beat his dog up or something? <laughs> Listen here. I see you got a cute little Growlithe there. I'm gonna have to kick the shit out of it. Hey, you, know, you, can, you can stop making Pokemon games, but wouldn't it be unlucky if your house burned down? <laughs> not that... Not that I'm going to do that, but, you know, houses burn down, children get hurt, legs disappear. Well, what's that? You couldn't afford to take out an insurance policy on this house? That seems pretty unsafe, buddy. Uh, but yeah, Pokemon So he too. convinced him. Pretty pretty, pretty convincing guy. Cool. He does convince him. Well, we will never know how many threats of burning down his house that included, but yeah. we can we can guess. Um, so yeah, so they're like, Pokemon 2, this is going to be a thing. The goal, make it a bigger game, make it a better game. New Pokemon, new locations, all the stuff they couldn't fit into the last game. But there were delays, because of course there were, right? And they wanted to get it right. To Jerry, quote, if I wanted to, I could have just made something half-assed and already released it, but I didn't want to make that kind of game. I'm determined to make something interesting, and that takes a lot of time. So the, re the region would be called Johto, and it was based on the Kansai region of Japan, and they really wanted to push the Game Boy to its limit with better graphics, more Pokemon, new types, all of it. But that would take time. And in the meantime, to capitalize on the Pokemon craze... There was a push to create Pokemon Center stores in Japan where they could start selling official Pokemon merchandise. And as these started opening, the three companies involved, right, Creatures, uh, Game Freak, and Nintendo, decided that there needed to be another company that existed for the purpose of managing the Pokemon Center locations. So the three companies get together, start a joint company called the Pokemon Center Company. We'll loop back around to them soon. Okay, the preparations have begun to bring Pokemon to the rest of the world, starting with the United States. Now, you might wonder, why did they pick the colors red and blue when they sent the games to the U.S.? Supposedly, it's because they are the colors on the American flag, and they thought that it might give them a sales boost. Docs, are we really easily that swayed? I mean, we had a similar um, suggestion for the Sol how Sonic was designed, right? That they yep. chose colors that appeal to the American market. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you Americans are uh, probably the easiest, most easily swayed people in the world to just show you. Like, if, if, I, if I would now, I don't do it. Like, in school, we are taught don't hold up uh, red, white, and blue colors to Americans because mm -hmm. they will get hypnotized immediately, so I'm not going to mm -hmm. do it. But if I would do that right now, I could basically tell you to do anything. That's fair. I mean, that's how you got me to do the podcast. I mean... Just held up a flag and said, we're doing it. And whenever you kind of have skeptical thoughts, I just mm -hmm. send you that one image and tell you, mm -hmm. Tyler, write another podcast episode. <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> and, then, and then you get to work and it has been working all right for the last. <laughs> I don't uh, care if it takes eight months, you little shit. You're going to do it. Do it for America. <laughs> America. America. Yeah. So that makes total sense to just give you red and blue cartridges to make you buy it. Mm-hmm. Okay, the localization is going on. There are some worries. They started working with localization teams at Nintendo of America. Ishihara started talking about some of these things in an interview, where he said that they were concerned with how the game would be received by the American audience in particular. Okay, not international audiences, totally, just America. There had been localized attempts at selling RPGs to Americans before, but they never sold well. Dragon Quest III, for example, had a massive release, sold millions of copies in Japan, but it sold 100,000 copies in the U.S. So yeah. there was a thought, well, what if American gamers don't like reading? Like lots of text equals <laughs> bad. <laughs> Quote, we thought kids would see the first couple of windows of text and think, what the heck is this? Fuck, I never learned to read. Our <laughs> education system is fucked so hard. I'm going like to drink another game. Coke and shoot. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to keep going because this is going to get really sad soon because oh. your country is in a bad, bad place right now. So, yeah, no. I sure would like them Pika-mans if I could learn how to read. 
Okay, but to, to a serious note, there is like systematic differences in demographics. So it, it might, you, you have to consider different things. It's true. And maybe there's a, there's a gaming culture that is not based on reading as much as Japanese gaming culture, which I think from the Japanese, I'm, I'm not an expert on Japanese gaming, but I know that the Japanese games that I've played are heavily text based games, which is not just not in, not just an America problem, but it would also be a problem in Europe. So reducing the text is probably a sensible consideration. It's true. There were some technical issues as well. In the Japanese version, you could fit someone's name into four or five characters, but the English alphabet is less condensed, meaning that you could only use short names. That brought with it coding issues that they needed to change the games entirely down to even how they were programmed. Things like the Pokédex needed a revamp too, and they needed Pokédex entries to be able to display on multiple screens in order to fit enough dialogue. Also, each Pokémon needed an English name. They thought that Pokémon had only about a 10% chance of success outside of Japan. They were like, this isn't going to happen. But with all of that, the game's selling so well, they had to try. Nintendo just viewed this whole thing as just basically rolling the dice with this expectation that it wouldn't pay off. But Nintendo kind of has like, fuck you money, so like they did it anyway. Okay. The localization process was a weird one. Uh, I loved some of the stuff about what they wanted to change. So this is Sugimori. Yeah, the first time we showed off some Pokemon in the US, we were told they were too cute. The staff in America submitted their ideas for replacement designs, but we just couldn't believe the kind of stuff that they were proposing. They turned Pikachu into something like a tiger with huge breasts. It looked like from the musical (laughs) Cats. When I asked, how is this supposed to be Pikachu? They said, well, look, there's its tail right there. Seriously, that was the kind of stuff being proposed. Oof, Oof, indeed. (laughs) Oof. Hey, uh, I was thinking that uh, Pikachu needed to be more (laughs) sexy-like. It's really got to have an appeal, okay? And not just an appeal, but like an appeal, okay? Fucking gross. Those, those, Those video game people in America were just doing too much cocaine. Probably. Probably. Uh, But yeah, so that's like the kind of revamp they wanted to do. And then they also wanted to take Ken Sugimori's really famous watercolor style. And they were like convinced that they needed to go in with like a graffiti art kind of style. And they contracted (sighs) some artists to draw Pokemon in this new style. But that like really bombed. Um, I think I I have a picture here of what they wanted Charizard to look like. Make it extreme. Extreme Charizard. I mean, that's kind of cool, but not cute. Not cute. It doesn't fit with the vibe. Ultimately, it was decided that if the text problem was going to be what killed them, if kids hate reading, then they would rather just leave the game as intended. Okay? But there were some localization changes made for the American market, made by translator Nob Ogasawara, if I said that correctly, though I should note he made these changes on his own accord. References to alcohol were removed. A hiker who is on magic mushrooms in the Japanese version just has a bad case of hay fever. In one scene, there is a- That one exists in Germany as well. He also has hay fever. He was on mushrooms? He was on mushrooms. (laughs) Yep. He was tripping balls. (laughs) In one scene, there is a Buddhist statue in a house, because remember, first gen, they're, they're like this is like the real world in Pokemon of Appear. Yeah. Um, he changed it in the translation to just be a diglet, like the little critter that comes out of the ground. Yeah. Um, he added in some of his uh, favorite references to movies, songs, and anime. We'll get to one of those in a minute. One change that he wanted to make, though, was that he thought that the Pokemon Mr. Mime should have a name change. He was convinced that in later generations, they would give Pokemon genders. Nintendo said no. But at the time, we know that he was spot on. He started making some changes that Nintendo didn't like. They threatened to terminate his contract. If I understand correctly, one of the things that they took a big issue with was in a scene, there is a, you fight a Spearow and it has a nickname or like you get given a Spearow or something. It has a nickname. The Spearow's name was Brittany. Because Britney Spears was big at the time. Britney Spiro. Yeah. Ooh, that's tough. I won't dig too far into all of the differences regarding localization in uh, different countries. But if you have a question, though, mm-hmm. like 
I know that in English and in German, there's a lot of play on words in the names of the Pokemon, right? Like Ekans, it's mm -hmm. just snake backwards and stuff like that. In German, it's the same. Does that come from the Japanese? Is the the naming of the Pokemon as playful? Yeah, that in seems the, to in be the Japanese version. Yeah, it seems to be. Okay. Um, I always wondered about goofy that. little puns and references to things. Yeah, because then I especially appreciate the localization because they did, really did a good job on kind of figuring out these little puns and these little players place on words. Yep, things that are relevant for, to for the, the culture that they're exporting it to. Yeah, like. Abra, Kadabra, Alashazam, mm -hmm. right? I always love that. And it's the same in German, Abra, Kadabra, Simsala, because that's the, the, the spell you do in German. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that you, you are right. Um, and if you want to know more about that, um, I did watch a video, uh, it, was called, it was from Did You Know Gaming, called How Pokemon Red and Blue Were Changed Around the World. Um, it's maybe 15 minutes long, very comprehensive, if you want to check that out. Hey, um, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, while they're working on this, the first Pokemon movie released in Japan on July 18th of 1998. It was called Pocket Monsters, the movie Mewtwo Strikes Back. Uh, it, it kind of concludes the show at like at like one part of the show, right? Yeah, so um, it definitely, well, it's definitely darker. So um, there, well, it ties in pretty heavily and I guess you could say it could be like an end if you wanted it to end there, but they didn't at that point. Yeah, of um, course it went on. Yeah. Takeshi Shudo, who was the head writer in the early days of the anime had pushed for a much darker tone for the movie than the series usually had. And some have suggested that he got away with this because his superiors were more worried about dealing with the fallout from the Pokemon shock than like supervising yeah. him. And so what we got is a movie that has like some pretty emotional moments and where Mewtwo like straight up murders people. Um, yeah, it's super dark. It really I is. I remember that. And I remember that that was really appealing that it, that they made Mewtwo in like in, in, into this conflicting, interesting character mm -hmm. that is evil for good reasons. Yeah. Um, that was cool. Some of that got shifted around when it released in different places there was supposed to be more of it but we'll get to that in a second i think i have more on it yeah. in here um but anyway it had a budget of five million dollars the movie ended up grossing over 170 million dollars so big return on investment there also of note around this time there were some other pokemon games that that hit the market um we'll just go through them pokemon stadium uh had a japanese oh. released you remember pokemon stadium yeah. August 1st of 1998. The game let you connect your Game Boy cartridges through an adapter to your N64. You could then battle with some of your Pokemon in 3D. Um, as a fun side uh, fact, for those of you who listened to the N64 episode of the podcast, you might remember that Nintendo briefly like flirted with this idea of adding a disk drive to the N64 called the 64DD. The first release of Pokemon Stadium was supposed to make use of an expansion disk, but when this never materialized, they had to reduce the number of Pokemon on the cartridge to 40. This is one of the reasons that the first version of Pokemon Stadium never saw a release out of Japan. I remember how Pokemon Stadium always felt like an unfinished thing. Mm -hmm. Like it, it felt like we were, we, we were amazed by it in the beginning, but it really quickly appeared to us that the, the, there wasn't much to do yeah. except for showing off this gimmick. Yeah, that was pretty uh, much it, that right? Always annoyed me. Seeing your seeing your Pokemon in 3D. That's the big selling point. Yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Very exciting at the time, but even with those little Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. It sold um 270,000 copies in its first month of release. So other people thought that was cool too. Um yeah. then they put out an updated version the following year which did well. And that's the one they started to export. Um Yep. As you mentioned, Pokemon Yellow, an enhanced version of Red and Blue, released in Japan on September 12th, 1998. The version had some slightly improved graphics, some new minor mechanics, the ability to print stickers from your Pokédex if you had access to the Game Boy printer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The story also changed slightly to include more references to the anime. Um, then, only a few weeks later, the storm is unleashed. Pokemon Red and Blue were releases in the United States. 
but this time they knew what they had and they were prepared. The Game Boy was beginning to age and this would breathe new life into the console. While it had taken time for Pokemon to catch on in Japan, the release of Pokemon in the U.S. came with a quick release of many of the existing facets of the franchise. It took only a single month for the Pokemon anime to become the most watched children's show in the United States. Replay by Tristan Donovan described Pokemon as, quote, a tipping point for the spread of Japanese pop culture, paving the way for the rapid spread of anime and manga into North America and Europe. So Pokemon, in his opinion, is what made this, like made anime more palatable um, to international audiences. I mean, there was anime before, but it, it probably made it accessible to the vast majority of people. That's a better way to put it. But even for all of this, everything that's going on, all the money that's raking in, Game Freak was still kind of struggling with their finances. They had spent all of the development money that they had been given for um, the Pokemon sequel, and it still wasn't where it needed to be. To make a long story short, Masuda steps up again and takes over a lot of development. So not just doing programming anymore, he's just like taking over parts of development. In November of 1998, Nintendo releases the Game Boy Color. This version had a color screen, and the console dropped at a time when Pokemon was taking off around the world. Now, I didn't mention this, but they had like added the potential to give Pokemon color, uh, because there was like a peripheral, you could like plug things into your I think it was your Super Nintendo at the time. Um, that paid off because now the Game Boy Color let everything be in color. And so there were some limited color options already programmed in, ready to go. Sales began to explode. I read a blurb saying that it was Pokemon that drove handheld sales, like you said, right? People bought handhelds to play Pokemon. Stephen Kent's Ultimate History of Video Games had a bit about it. In 1997, handheld sales were 294 million. When Pokemon dropped in the US that year, handheld sales went to 466 million. Um, after Red and Blue became the hottest games on the market and the Game Boy Color released, handheld sales were 1.26 billion in 1999. It was 18% of the gaming market. So, Shit. Yeah, a lot. That game sold their hardware. That's amazing. Yep. Pokemon was translated into six different languages, Japanese, English, French, German, Spanish, and Italian. In late 1999, Creatures and Hudson Soft released the Game Boy version of the Pokemon trading card game, which had digital versions of cards you could use in your decks. You could also use the link cable to play Pokemon cards with your friends. It sold over 600,000 copies in Japan the following year, and when it released in North America, it sold 1.51 million copies in a year. As a side note, have you ever played this game? The Pokemon Trading Card Game Boy game? No, never. Uh, so I busted it out um, about a year ago. I tried it. Um, I streamed a little bit of it, too. It still holds up. Mechanically, It you know, it's a Game Boy game, but it's actually like pretty fun. And the music sounds really good because it's like... It's like you're hearing it and you're like, this is, I know this is Pokemon music, but I've never heard it before. Right? Mm -hmm. Like really strange. So uh, it was pretty cool. Cool. I would recommend What's, it. How, what, like, like talk me through it. How does the game work? Um, you remember an inscription when you get to the second chapter yeah. and you start off with a starter deck and then you get booster packs and you add to it and you go and you beat different. Um, yeah. Okay. That so you, you walk around, you beat guys, you get more cards, you put them into your deck, you beat more guys. That That's chapter it. of Inscription was based on the Pokemon TCG's playstyle. That's oh, where that comes from. Oh, I get it. Yep. Okay. Shout out to Inscription. That's an awesome game. What a killer game. Loved it. Um, in December of 1998... The physical Pokemon TCG hit the U.S. and also just took off. By April of the following year, 2.5 million Pokemon cartridges has been sold and 850,000 sets of trading cards had been sold. Although I want to be clear, I don't know what a set is in this metric. Is this packs? Is this decks? Is this everything? I don't know. But a fuck ton. Mm. Okay? Yeah. It was just everywhere and the team was so surprised apparently they would see pokemon merch out in the world and get really excited to see like oh my gosh it's pikachu and then they would like buy merch and take it back with them um which i thought was cute yeah it was their babies right later on that year on november 12th 1999 the u.s saw their own release of pokemon the first movie mewtwo strikes back i went to see it 
I was so excited. I remember I cried in the theater, but I was also like a little confused because uh, I'm going to spoil a very old movie for all of you. There's a big fight at the end where all the Pokemon fight their clones and everyone's like crying and they're like, oh no, Pokemon shouldn't fight each other like this. And I was like, well, fucking wait, isn't that the point? Is it like a whole point is that these things fight and kill each other? Like, isn't that the whole point of the game? Right. <laughs> but apparently that is what we do. <laughs> that is what we do. This is our purpose to kill. Kill them all. <laughs> uh, apparently there were major script edits when it was localized to other countries. I guess that the original one had like Mewtwo having like this big existential crisis about like the meaning of existence. And they like took some of that out to make it more palatable to kids. But I think they made it worse. Like, I think that we shouldn't like underestimate the intelligence of children. Right. Yeah, but don't underestimate the censors. They don't, they get really, really mean if you want to sell something to children. Uh, it's true. You want to hear my favorite story about the, uh, the Pokemon movie? Uh, I will not name this friend, uh, because I don't want to shame them, but I will tell their story. Um, he told me he went to see the Pokemon movie and he was so excited to see how it was going that he didn't want to leave the theater and he purposefully pissed his own pants so that he could keep watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and what? He was like, I'm not getting up to go pee. He was like purposely pissed himself. I think about that every time I think about Mewtwo. So if you're out there, man, and you're listening, thanks. <laughs> Uh, okay <laughs> it was at the time as you might expect the highest earning japanese movie to ever be shown in the u.s it made like think of every other japanese movie that came to the u.s it made the most money and then in november of 1999 pokemon gold and silver finally released in japan the second generation of pokemon had come it was here those games were such bangers they fucking were i loved them they were so good um, they had a ton of interesting features. I'll just kind of rattle a bunch of them off. You could transfer your old Pokemon. If you had two Game Boys, you could transfer your old Pokemon from red and blue onto gold and silver forward into the new game. Backward compatibility of this kind was extremely rare in these days. And it was such a cool idea to me. And yeah. when I think about things that have kept me coming back to Pokemon over the years, this is one of them. The ability to pull my old critters that all, oh shit, it's Chunks, my favorite, and, you know, and I pull him in and he's on my team and I'm all excited. And like, it's kind of like seeing old friends you haven't seen in a long time, yeah. right? Love it. Um, the player character, you could choose the gender of your player character at the start and Pokemon also had genders. Um, there were new, oh, yeah. there were new types. Some Pokemon gained more types for balance purposes. Items now had descriptions on what they did. You could see more of the screen. The graphics were better. They made battling easier. There was a day and night cycle, different music, different Pokemon to catch. Dude, there was different Pokemon for day and night. It was so insane. There was so much stuff. Yep. It had an internal clock Amazing. to know, like you'd set the clock and it would keep time. Um, yeah. This is when they added in rare Pokemon, as they called them, which was later changed to shiny. You had, yeah, you, and also there was these these legendary things that you would not find in one spot, like the legendary birds, legendary but dogs. like the legendary dogs. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you would have to travel around, and they would go like in this pattern, and you would have to go to these certain meadows where they would show up for a certain amount of time, and that was insane. Yep, it really was. Um, and so what this all meant was uh, that you had some really unique stuff that you could show off to your friends, you could battle with. Like, they just took everything that made Pokemon cool and made it better, I think. Yeah. And one of the coolest hidden parts in this game is that after you beat it, you could go back to Kanto from the first game and fully explore that region oh, yeah. again. And you can go and fight Red, the main character of the original games, uh, at the top of Mount Moon, I think it is. He's he's in that um, cave thing. Right? Yep. And he has uh, he has the night evolution of Eevee. I just remember he has his team basically from the anime. So let me see if I can remember. Yeah. It's like maybe I'm confused. He's got I think he's got a Charizard, a Bulbasaur, a Squirtle, Pikachu, uh, Lapras, Snorlax. I think is his team. If I'm right. Maybe I'm confusing things, but yeah, he's 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 there. I fought him. Yep. 
Uh, that was the coolest. I still think that is the coolest thing I've ever done in a Pokemon game. That fight felt so cool. Like, ugh. Because he also he also feels like such a badass, mm -hmm. and it makes you feel better, right? Yep. And he's got stronger Pokemon than anything you fight in the game, and like he, yeah, ah, oh, so cool. Um, that thing with Kanto being in the game, um, there is a story that uh, Iwata gave them the space to add Kanto by compressing the game's code, but I cannot find a source to confirm this. Like this gets repeated around a lot. My hot take is that this might just be an urban legend. Um, he did look at the code, but there's like this urban legend that he like stayed up all night one night and figured out how to compress the code and figured out how to put Kanto in it. I do not know that that is true. If I am wrong, you are free to send me an email about it, but I cannot find a source on this. At this point, I have to ask you a few things about Pokemon that are involve Pokemon culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask these questions now because I decided to do it. Okay. If you fight another Pokemon, when you wanted the enemy Pokemon to die, would you also tip your Game Boy sideways <laughs> so the health bar would drain out? I've never done this. <laughs> I had so many friends that did that. Yeah. Just because it felt right to do. <laughs> also, another Pokemon idiosyncrasm. If you if if you throw a Pokeball mm -hmm. and you it, it wiggles around, did you also try to push the A button at at the point of the wiggle to make the Pokeball stay tight? I was told that this was something that you could do. And I remember I was, uh, so I didn't like actually play these games until I was in high school. And I remember testing it and like a couple of times and I saw no like perceptible difference and I never did it again, but that was everywhere. I always did it. That was everywhere. Yeah. And I think there's a few others of those that I did, but I can't remember them because they were so automatic. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to know if those were like just in my circle of friends, I have the, of those who are really everywhere. The health bar one I've never heard of. The throwing the ball and hitting A, I have heard of. That definitely made it made it to us. Okay. So, um, there were a bunch of spin-off games that dropped during this time I haven't even mentioned. We'll just rattle them off. There was Hey You Pikachu for the N64, a game where you could use a microphone to talk to Pikachu. There was Pokemon... There was probably a, a Tamagotchi, right? A Pikachu Tamagotchi? Oh, yeah, there actually was. Um, the uh, the pocket Pikachu. Uh, like, literally this. Here, I'll hold it up. He has it in his hands. I have it in my hand. It sits on my desk. A piece of shit. Of course he has it. Of course I do. <laughs> pocket Pikachu too. I bought this after Amazing. I defended my dissertation. Cool. It was my gift nice. to myself. Oh, I remember. Yeah. And I took nice. it and our editor programmed it because it has a programmable alarm. And every day at 8 p.m. or as the clock slowly fades, 7.52, uh, it plays the Golden Saucer theme as played on a pocket Pikachu. And it is just the joy of my day. Andre and I dance yes, every time cool. it comes on. Yeah, I absolutely fucking have one of these. Of course I did. Awesome. <laughs> I bought it recently. But anyway. Uh, so, yeah, different thing. Hey, you Pikachu on the yeah. N64. Um, yeah. There was Pokemon Snap, a game about being a Pokemon photographer. I loved that game. I remember that Pokemon Snap was better than it should have been. Yep. Did I ever... It was, it was just a really good game. Did I ever tell you my Pokemon Snap story? It's, it's a bit of a, oh, a side thing. Maybe? Um, okay, so there was this cool thing that they did to partner with Blockbuster. And you could... Uh, the game would have you save your favorite photos. Okay. And it would have a little spot, save your favorite photos here. And then you can do stuff with them with outside peripherals. And our blockbuster had a thing where you could bring your cartridge in and you could plug your cartridge in and it would let you print stickers of your photos from the game. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the coolest thing that has ever happened in life ever. I have to do this. And I spent all this time. I asked my parents, can I take this? Can I go get stickers made? And they were like, yeah, sure, buddy. And I picked all my favorite photos and I got all my favorite ones and I made sure they all looked great. And we went to Blockbuster and they said, Oh, I'm really sorry. We just got rid of that machine yesterday. Fuck. I never got to print my stickers. It's because you're overprepared, right? I'm overprepared. Sometimes you just got to go for it. <laughs> Dude. It's still better. It's a, it's a, I can't imagine. 34 years old, I'm that's, still better. That's why you always overprepare episodes, because that's, <laughs> uh, it's, that, it's that trauma. Yeah. You can't, you can't get rid of it. I can't let it go. <laughs> you can't. 
<laughs> yeah, you have to you have to repeat your mistake over and over again. You have to live through it every time. Do you remember on the stream how I was giving away photos for a while, like print out photos that I would send to people? I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. Okay. I got that because I told this story to our friend Picaro once. <clears throat> and when Pokemon Snap, they made a Pokemon Snap um, like game for the Switch. Really good, by the way. They partnered with a company that did photo printouts. And they were like, print out your Pokedex. And uh, that's where I got the um, like the bit of the joke on the stream that I would send people pictures of Bidoof. Uh, that's where that came from. <laughs> I bought the photo printer as like sort of an homage to this trauma of never getting to print my fucking stickers. That's where that came from. So now you know. A little bit of the... Send me your the, Diglett, man. The t- <laughs> send me your... Send Diglett pics. I sent you my Diglett. Please respond. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, po- anyway. Pokemon Pinball, which was a <laughs> pinball game that came with your favorite thing, a battery-powered rumble pack that you could put into the back of your Game Boy. I know you hate rumble f- features. Yeah. Um, Good for them, I guess. Bad for your joints. Uh, <laughs> a sequel to Pokemon Stadium, or a bit more of a rebranding, hit the U.S. in early 2000. Um, also, I'm using like all of like the hit the U.S. and did this. Uh, everything in Europe was like about a year later when all of these things hit. So if I'm saying this hit in yeah. 2000, it usually hit in 2001 for you. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it hit the U.S. Pokemon Stadium sold a million copies. Gold and Silver hit the U.S. They became the best-selling game that year. Just to give you give you sales numbers from both Japan and the U.S., by the end of 2000, there had been roughly 6.5 million copies of the game that sold in Japan. In the U.S., before Gold and Silver even hit, it sold a million copies before the game even released. Okay? There were a million pre-orders that were sold before it even hit. What? That's how popular it was. It took the record of being the fastest-selling game ever. I think it's been usurped by something later, but amazing. I mean, yeah, because the market grew, but that's why you can never compare these yep. numbers over time. But yeah, that's and, still um, impressive. You know, I mentioned that like you you would get stuff in Germany like a year or two later. Um, I did a little bit of digging, and generally, in when they would hit in Germany, the games they would sell very well in Germany as well. In Germany, Gold and Silver, I have this written in my notes, received two double platinum awards for the. I'm going to fucking bastardize this word. Verband der Unterhaltungssoftware. Verband der Unterhaltungssoftware. Uh-huh. Yeah, just like that. That was, that was, no, no, that was, you know, whenever I say that was okay, you don't believe me, but that's, you did your best. I tried. It was. Um, yeah. They had sales above 800,000 copies by 2002, so they got like double platinum awards. This is like a big thing back then. Um, okay. considering how much smaller your population than is than ours, that's pretty sizable comparisons, right? Yep. Um, okay. Now, do you remember how I mentioned that Game Freak, Nintendo, and Creatures all went in together to make a Pokemon Center company? Well. Yes. Pokemon is going just fucking bonkers. And companies from all over the world wanted to make deals with the Pokemon brand. But if you can believe it, all licensed products... Every Pokemon item you saw had to go through creatures, but even more specifically, the person approving these was just Ishihara. All of them. All of this branding for a time was just Ishihara going, yeah, that seems good. That is just... Did he spend his entire time, like, there was a huge row of people that were, each of them was holding one item, <laughs> and they'd come in one after the other and present it to them, and he was going, uh, oh, uh. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then there was like a, a a little group of people that would have to interpret his noises mm-hmm. to see if if it was approved or not. Oh, that's exactly how that went. A hundred percent. That is a fact. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. I've seen the video. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a video. They recorded they it. Were, all of course. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It was a hit TV show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I actually have no idea. Uh, but that's just too much for one yeah. guy to do, right? And so it is. Yeah, a decision was made. The three companies agreed that the Pokemon Center Company would instead become the Pokemon Company. This sort of parent company would pull together all the different parts of the brand under one umbrella for easier management and brand consistency. And they put Ishihara in charge of it. Ishihara was so involved with Pokemon branding and merchandise during this time. The people who knew him used to call him the king of portable toys. 
which I think is a fine title to have. Yeah. This company slowly grew and absorbed the responsibilities of some of its subsidiaries. For example, like they took over the Pokemon TCG. And of course, I've talked all about the games. I've talked all about this stuff, but it wouldn't have been a 90s or even an early 2000s fad without massive cultural backlash. A quick reminder that at this time, there was a very big push against video games happening, claiming that they made kids violent. So keep that in mind as I go through all this. Here is just a speed run of all the weird claims that either like I experienced or I saw in articles and I read all these articles about all this crazy shit. Okay. Pokemon was witchcraft and Pokemon were demons. Some Good old classic satanic panic shit. Yeah. Yep. Some fundamentalist Christian groups claimed that the game was linked to satanic worship. They also claimed that Pokemon furthered the gay agenda because Ash and Brock in the anime were such good friends. Well, oh, man. Dudes aren't allowed to have friends, no, I guess. No, no, no. I don't know. I don't I have, know. No, no. Uh, supposedly, there were lawsuits. Um pressed against the Pokemon company, uh, claiming that the way that Nintendo sold uh, Pokemon trading cards promoted... Wait, can we go back, like, die back a second? Oh? Isn't Brock, like, very offensively into every girl that he meets, and that's his whole character, mm -hmm. like, for the entire first two seasons, mm -hmm. that his only thing is that whenever they meet a woman, he turns into a complete idiot mm -hmm. that can do nothing but try to marry the woman that they just met? That sounds like the gay agenda to me. I just wanted to say this. Yeah, that's a gay agenda. <laughs> yeah, right. What? Like, okay, listen, I interrupted you. That I'm would require sorry. critical thought to actually think through the motivations of these characters, right? Like, but no. Okay. Satanic panic. So, um, yeah, so there were some lawsuits against the Pokemon company claimed that the way that Nintendo sold um, trading cards promoted gambling. That was always what I heard. Pokemon is evil. It's gambling. Um, I will give them, I guess, some very minor credit. That, I, like, will, I would, I mean, that is the most credible critique because it does. Yeah, like, you know, like. It simply does. What's the modern equivalent of a TCG? And that is a general problem about trading cards, and it has been since baseball trading cards. Yep. Yep, yep. But those won't be critiqued. No. So. No, because that's yeah. good old American baseball. Uh, South Park did an episode. You know you've made it when South Park does an episode where the Japanese are trying to destroy America by indoctrinating children into a Pokemon analog called Chin Pokemon. Um, I'm also pretty sure that Kenny dies in that episode due to the Pokemon shock. Yeah. I'm almost <laughs> certain. Um there was a thing going around called the Poke Flu, is what it was called, and it was any day that a game or a po Pokemon game or movie would come out, a bunch of kids would get the flu, right? Yeah, they were sick. They had to stay home. Can't, they did. Can't. Yeah, it's, it's very just important. The truth. Uh, schools began to ban cards because kids were getting distracted or stealing from each other or getting into fights. Don't know how true any of that is, but there was a police department in the U S that called the game quote, America's most dangerous hobby. <sighs> yep. Pokemon. I, I just, I, I just can loudly sigh right now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, time magazine wrote an article that was basically a hit piece on Pokemon in late 1999 called Beware of the Pokemania uh, that tried to explain the Pokemon craze to parents. And even though it was actually a bit informative for people who wouldn't know, uh, today it reads as like really disparaging about the whole thing and maybe a bit mean to Tajiri himself. And it was like filled with all the bad things that kids could run into and all the ways they could just basically die if they played Pokemon. So with all of that... What a time it was to be a kid then. It was everywhere. Like, it just consumed our lives. It was all we could talk about. It was all we could think about. My friend group was just absolutely obsessed, and so was so many other people, right? Pokemon spread so far and wide that it had become sort of a point of national pride in Japan. It was now a cultural export. I could get into the nitty gritty of all of the other games in the series, but now that we have covered what went on mostly in the Game Boy years, I think you get the general idea, right? Pokemon just kept going and going and going, and it just never stopped. And interest ebbs and flows, but it always comes back every couple of years and dominates the market again. Every time a new generation of Pokemon hits, there's a wave of people who are playing Pokemon and it crashes back into the scene. Um, yeah. 
Go ahead. Do you remember those two weeks of Pokemon Go? Yes, I'm going to talk about those actually before we finish up. But that that was in, that was insane. It was insane. Oh my god! Talk about a worldwide like, phenomenon. My what man. A, it was like Brave New World all of a sudden. <laughs> We're all going to go outside every day and meet in the park. Yep. <laughs> Fuck work. We are all friends now. World peace has been achieved. <laughs> There's a Charmander I'm, I'm, over there. Let's go get it. Unless we get bored after two weeks. But <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> I distinctly remember that there were so many people around playing it that we were walking down the street and you could just tell. And there was a guy who looked at me at one point and we locked eyes and he and his buddy, we like locked eyes and he went, you catching them all? And I went, you know it, bud. And it was because we were just all but out. It's but it's still there. It has not disappeared yet. It's still there. You still see mm-hmm. those groups congregating around these um wells or or little like bus stops or stuff like that they're all they're all holding their Mm -hmm. smartphones they're all different ages and they're all talking to each other and they're all doing those movements where they're constantly catching little tiny little pokemon you know it's still uh while it has kind of declined in popularity it's still uh like really massive in japan and when my wife lived there for about six months uh, she she played like all the time, and when she came back to the U.S., she quit because it was so popular in Japan, and there was so many like stops and Pokemon and raids and all this stuff going on all the time. And then she came back to like middle of nowhere where we were kind of living, and it was like, oh, this is a completely different game when I'm here, and it like wasn't as fun to her anymore. You, you can you can play it well if your area where you live is not densely yeah. populated. Um. Yeah, so we'll talk about Pokemon Go in, in a quick second. Um, but to those who don't yeah. know, like generally what happens when a Pokemon generation releases, they tend to add somewhere between like 100 to 150 new Pokemon. Um, that's kind of like one of the selling points. Oh, you're going to get an influx of new Pokemon. Um, there's like over 1,000 Pokemon now. Um, sometimes people have asked them why they don't add more. Uh, what I had read from within the company is they said, it's not necessarily that they don't have a problem of ideas and they can always make more. It's just that you can only do so much with one project. And then they also kind of worried about like balance issues and things like that. I, I recently heard this critique that um, the, the Pokemon they add now are basically just animals. And I'm just like, have you played the original Pokemon? Right? Those were always just, weirdly colored animals there never was like there's always a few weird ones but most of them are just snakes and birds yeah um i think that like there's definitely been times where i'm like is that pokemon an ice cream cone is that pokemon literally (laughs) a bag of trash that evolves into a larger bag of trash wow look at that one it's just a (laughs) snowflake right and like but then when you go back and you actually look at the original designs you're like that's a rat <laughs> that one's just a, just a that was just a pokeball and when it evolves it turns upside down right it's like, just one is a mouse and the other one is a mouse that hasn't shaved for two weeks. right right like you know like that one's a snake that one's a bigger snake, right? Like that one's a cat yeah. that turns into a different cat. Like you can do it for all of them, <laughs> but it's just because we know those ones. They're so ingrained, right? Like people will always bitch about everything, but, um, but though I always liked the idea with the plant Pokemons where there's like, it's, it should basically shows the development of a plant mm-hmm. where like the, the little, what's the, the unopened flower called? Uh, the the but the but yeah. the but where the but turns into the open flower with um Bulbasaur to what's the final English version Venusaur. of that Venusaur oh, Ven- uh, Bulbasaur I Ivysaur like Venusaur yep yeah that is really cool um supposedly uh it was that uh, Venusaur was supposed to be very frog like um and still sort of is but the design has changed a little bit over the years and now there's like people argue over whether it's like a lizard or like i don't know but we're You're like a big toad or something right yeah i always thought of it as like a big toad big big frog type thing but anyway uh as the games have gone on everything is much more streamlined now and it is on a schedule and there is this balance of this like massive massive brand chugging forward where they're always thinking about the games the merchandise 
the card game, the anime, and everything has to be done in a particular order. And the games have to be made on a timetable that allows for everything else to be created. And so... These things are all sort of made in tandem, but because Pokemon is so massive, this is why some of the newer Pokemon games feel rushed. They are on release schedules that are carried forward by their own momentum. So you say, we need another year to fix all of the bugs in Scarlet and Violet. You don't have another year because the TCG has to drop. The anime needs new shit to do, right? Like the movies have to get made. The merchandise has to get made a year ahead of time, right? Like there's no time anymore. And so like Pokemon has almost outgrown itself in some ways. So the ship has gotten too big and now they can't maneuver it efficiently anymore. That's a great way to put that. In 2014, as you mentioned, there was an April Fool's joke on Google Maps where users could catch Pokemon. This was a big hit, and Ishihara noticed. He had been playing an augmented reality game called Ingress. I have actually played a little bit of Ingress back in the day. Um, you'd walk around, you'd find things that, you know, little places you could attack and do things. You had to be on your phone to do it. The game was made by a company called Niantic Labs. He started negotiating with them if they wanted to make a Pokemon augmented reality game. And what came from this venture was a mobile game called Pokemon Go, which uh, released in 2016. It took over absolutely everything. Um, the app apparently brought in over 50 times what they had projected, and the massive influx of players crashed their servers. The app was completely broken at times. You couldn't play it because it was just too much. Yep. While their revenue stream has slowed, they were raking in cash, and I have seen estimates that the game over the course of its life has made about $5 billion. Um, but what I think that it has really done is it just further solidified Pokemon as a brand. You had access to it. It was everywhere. You know, like, I feel like the investment that they put in is paying off on people who would have never interacted with Pokemon doing so, right? It made people play Pokemon that had nothing to do with it. It made people from our parents' generation and even older people pick up their smartphone and walk around and connect with young people all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. I feel like people tend to forget that that was a cultural movement that could have been something good and then it just disappeared. And it, it, it was like it got people outside and it was the summer all of a sudden. Yeah. And I it felt really good because it felt like gaming, but you didn't have those post coital depression afterwards <laughs> where you're like, Does this mean anything? <laughs> no, you were hanging out with people and you were having a good time. Uh like I I think that that period of a few months is the closest thing that I remember to what it was like to be a kid in the 90s and experiencing yeah. Pokemon for the first time. Because, like, absolutely, everyone you knew knew about it, or they had it. You would walk by people. You'd know they were catching stuff. People were out all night playing. Um, you know, Andrea and I would get in the car, and we would drive to, like, different parts of the city and just walk around for hours. Just hours in the middle of the night. Um, just so we could catch stuff. And it was just really something special. And, <clears throat> you know, I, there was always, like, like a bit of like the darker side of things, right? Like people getting into car accidents, breaking into places to get at stops, like all kinds of shenanigans that you get with anything like that. But like, it was really something and it was everywhere. And like, you know, I have memories of like, oh my gosh, there's a drag, you know, someone yelling, there's a Dragonite down there. And I like sprint down this hill. I'm like drunk outside of the bar and I'm like running down this hill to catch this Dragonite. And I'm screaming, I caught it. I fucking caught it. Oh my God. <laughs> and I remember I had that Dragonite. His name was Leopold. I remember Leopold. Um, and that's just like, you don't have something like that, right? Um, anymore. Um, but I will also say it also led to perhaps the cringiest line of any political speech I've, I've ever heard. And like, maybe it's not the worst, but it's the one I personally can't let go of. So let me take you back. Hillary Clinton was running for president of the United States. She was giving a speech in Annandale, Virginia, which is like not far from DC where she was talking about how there were going to be a lot of new jobs coming up. She won. There can be all these new jobs and coding opportunities for apps. And she said, quote, I don't know who created Pokemon Go, but I'm trying to figure out how we can get them to have Pokemon Go to the polls. And then she just kind of smiles 
and looks around like she did a great job. And it just fucking kills me, man. Andrea and I will still say to each other sometimes, we'll go, Pokemon, go to the polls. Uh, I encourage you. Politicians and their puns. I mean, yeah, it's just smile like you just do where you like <laughs> press press your lips together and not and try to try to not die i don't know who <laughs> told her that that line was a good idea but she did it and it's out there so but with that let's wrap up our tale <clears throat> um most of the people in the story uh still work on the pokemon games satoshi tajiri is still to this day the president of game freak He still works as the executive producer on most of the games. He is also the executive producer, or at least was, for the Detective Pikachu movie. Did you see Detective Pikachu? Such a good movie. So good. Shit, I wouldn't have expected it, but it was such a good movie. It really was. Just killer. It really caught how the Pokemon universe should be depicted. Yep. Damn. Uh, There will never be anything that good, and I hope they don't make a sequel, because I feel like they'll fuck it up, but... Yeah, my trust. I have trust issues. Anyway, Ken Sugimori uh, still creates art for Game Freak. He still works on every game. At times, he has directed teams of people in the company toward creating art and characters. So he's still doing art. Junichi Masuda left Game Freak in 2022, but he didn't go far. He is now the chief creative fellow at the Pokemon Company where he is currently employed. Sunikazu Ishihara is still the president of the Pokemon Company, though in April of 2023, not that long ago, he stepped down as CEO of Creatures uh, so that he could just focus on one role. He's just the CEO of Pokemon now. Takeshi Shudo, in kind of a sad story, a head writer of the Pokemon anime in the early years, I mentioned him. He developed a heavy reliance on um, booze and pills, and he died on October 29th of 2010 from a brain hemorrhage at a train station. Kind of a bummer there. Oh, no. Yeah. Atsuko Nishida, designer of Pikachu, still contributes to designs of the game sometimes, and uh, she still works on some of the related comics, like when they put out like a Pokemon comic. But it is very difficult to get information on her. She is uh, like a very private person. And so the last interview that I could find that she gave was in 2018. And she hid herself behind a giant Pikachu plush for the whole duration. She didn't even want her um, picture taken. Um, Yeah. We do know that at one point she worked on Hometown Story, which is a game that we briefly chatted about in the Harvest Moon episode long, long time ago. Koji Nishino, the inspiration for Snorlax, still works at Game Freak. He has been involved in uh, every mainline game since the beginning, or at least almost all of them. Uh, He mostly does game design and map planning, from what I can tell. Um, I also know that in one of the earlier games, I think it's the fifth gen, uh, you can fight him. He shows up and he has a Snorlax on his team. Um, (laughs) uh, When you go to fight him, he goes, I'm Snorlax. And if you didn't know this story, you'd have no idea what that meant, right? So... (laughs) Motofumi Fujiwara, one of the character artists and the creator of Eevee, worked with Game Freak until 2013, and then he became a freelance artist. He still contributes to Pokemon um, and is most recently being credited as uh, working on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, the newest games. Of their other games, I'll just tell you about the ones we talked about. Quinty has had some re-releases over the years. I know it made it onto the Wii U Virtual Console, and at one point it showed up in some of the Nomco collections. Ah. Jerry Bean, from what I can tell, has not had a modern release. Yoshi has had several re-releases in various Nintendo eShops. These days, you can play it through the NES subscription service on the Switch. Pulse Man is also available on the Nintendo Switch online service. I think you have to pay for like an upgrade, though. Um, and that just dropped in April of this year, that you can play Pulse Man. Um, previously, I think you could get it internationally on the Wii. Um, Game Freak has experimented with some other games over the years, but have had some limited success. Um, some of them are interesting. Pokemon Today is jointly owned by Game Freak, Nintendo, and Creatures Incorporated. I do not know who owns how much. There have been nine generations of Pokemon, as we call them, meaning that when a core game drops, you know, a new generation. The total number of Pokemon games as of writing this in May of 2023, is 122 games. That includes all spinoffs and different versions within generations. It would be near impossible to tell you where to get them all. Many of them are discontinued or out of print. The latest big release was Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which dropped in November 18 of 2022. 
It introduced a new generation of Pokemon. It was the most pre-ordered Pokemon game in history, and the game sold 10 million copies of the game within three days of release. Wow. Yep. Just insane. While the game was plagued with bugs and issues, by the end of 2022, it had already sold over 20 million units. For comparison, Gold and Silver sold 23.7 million, Sword and Shield sold 25.3 million, and the original game sold 31.3 million. So it's catching up, the new ones. And Pokemon does not show any signs of going away. Awesome. Uh, Just to wrap up the other aspects of the franchise, in 2011, the Pokemon TCG had a digital release. Last year, they released a beta of the Pokemon Trading Card Game Live, which was supposed to be an updated version. As of early 2022, there have been an estimated 43.2 billion, with a B, cards that have been printed for the Pokemon TCG. Interestingly, when the pandemic hit, there was a renewed interest in the Pokemon TCG, and with it, the TCG basically went mainstream again. However... The production level was not comparable to the new demand, so uh, people would just start like buying up as many cards as they could, regardless of what they were. And there were reports of like fights breaking out. Target uh, stopped selling the cards for a time, and to make up for the insane demand, what they did is they ramped up production of cards with nine billion Pokemon cards being printed in 2021 alone. If you total up all of the cards that were printed from 2020 to 2022, it is a fourth of all cards that have ever been printed. So I guess the Whoa. TCG is not going away either. Uh, also, insane. Yeah, right? Isn't that nuts to consider, right? Later this year, they're releasing something called Pokemon TCG Classic, which is a high-end box of cards that looks like an adult's like fancy briefcase. And when you open it up, it has a fabric play table inside, a bunch of the old cards from the base set, like decks made from the base set cards. Uh, all the things are metal, right? Like it's totally like, hey, are you a 30-something who has disposable income and fucking loves nostalgia? Buy this product. Awesome. As of the anime, in 2020, the anime airs in 194 countries. There have been over 1,200 episodes of the mainline show. That is not even counting the spinoffs. From what I can tell, there are 23 feature-length movies. I mentioned Detective Pikachu earlier. It's their only live-action one. It's great. It's probably my favorite. But the most interesting development with the anime just happened recently. Do you know what happened with the anime recently, Docs? It finished. It finished. They ended Ash's story after all these years. They had a world championship. He beat everyone. He became a Pokemon master. And he and Pikachu left off into the distance for other adventures. And of course, they're not going to stop making anime. But now they have a new set of protagonist children who are the main characters. They have different critters. I think that's a great choice. I think it's an awesome choice. That is what the old writer of the anime, um, Shudo, thought was a good call. Um, you know, get some new stories in there, change it up every couple of years. Um, I'll tell you this. I mean, Ash was the protagonist forever, mm-hmm. like more than 20 years. Yeah. So uh, uh, Takeshi Shudo wrote a blog once that I read about endings that he had toyed with. One was that Ash would grow old and die in like an emotional like end of life scene whereas he's like dying he like imagines himself at like his mother calling to him and he's like waking up on the first day of his adventure to go and be a pokemon master oh right um but he also talked about how he toyed with how his final episode of the anime, if they had let him do it, would be that all of the Pokemon would lead a massive uprising against the humans and their human oppressors and try to kill them. <laughs> so to conclude, to finally conclude, Pokemon has become, I think, part of um, it's more than a game. It is part of our greater culture. It is part of our daily lives. It is no longer a fad. It is no longer niche. It is the mainstream. They are some of the best-selling games of all time. And not just that, the merch, man. Um, Pokemon is, by many metrics, the highest-grossing media franchise in the world. And the majority of that money comes from merchandising. It generates them billions of dollars each year. And 
I will say it is hard to tell how much the franchise is actually worth because the Pokemon company stopped reporting some of their numbers back in 2019. But from what we know, Pokemon has had a total revenue of at least $118 billion and roughly 91 billion of that is just from merchandise. Um, and only around 27 billion is from the games. One time our editor said something to me as casually, and he said, you can put a Pokemon on anything and people will buy it. And I do, I think he's right. Like anything at all. Yeah, of course you can. Think of something, uh, a chair. Yeah, you can sell Pikachu chairs. No problem. A casket. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Uh, Maybe there's a child that died and really liked Pokemon. So you're going to buy a Pokemon casket. I made myself sad. Um, uh, it's okay. <laughs> people die, man. Not me. I'm going to live and forever. People, dead, dead people had wishes. Uh, <laughs> so you can buy them a Pokemon casket. <laughs> Pikachu. It can even say Pikachu when you touch it. Pikachu. Um, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. That is terrible. Uh, a, 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 a weed cutter. A weed whacker for your yard. Yeah, I mean, of course, weed. You can send anything to weed heads, so I don't know. <laughs> Not that kind of weed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have seen. Oh, I, I, I I thought like a, a weed grinder. I have seen a Pokeball grinder. Smoke. I definitely have seen a Pokemon grinder of, of a Pokeball that See? grinds weed in real life. Oh, you mean like a weed cutter, like to actually cut yes. weeds on? The yeah, metal. that's what yeah. I originally meant. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of random shit. Anyway, you can put a Pokemon on anything. People will buy it. Um, I think he's right. Yeah. Um, I think he's right. Much like other episodes, it really blows my mind how many times Pokemon came close to failing and and just like to never being made. Like all the money it needed, all the times they couldn't do something, somebody had to save them or open a door or, you know, a computer crash or they're you know all these people leave like there's just so many brushes with death that this series had and that always blows my mind um makes you wonder how many others didn't make it right right exactly how many how many things we missed that could have been great but for some minor reason because pokemon all the reasons that it could have died were never reasons that were due to its lack of quality it was just random stuff that happens in life right yeah. You like financing or some people that have influence for some reason or another just don't like what you pitch them. Mm -hmm. But it it has nothing to do that this could have been this cultural phenomenon. Yep. So maybe there was other things like it that just disappeared due to the randomness of life. Yeah. It's interesting to think about. Um so here's a quote that I think is a good send off. I'm gonna do this and then I'll tell you a little bit about my own experiences with Pokemon, and I'd like to hear some of yours. Joe Merrick, the webmaster of Cerebi, was saying this in 2019. He's going to mention something called Yokai Watch, which was a game that Bondi put out in 2013. It was like their answer to Pokemon, Yokai Watch. Um, it hit the international markets. They stopped pushing it 2017. But anyway, point being, Yokai Watch didn't work out. Okay, on Pokemon, Joe Merrick, quote, its impact back in the 90s was phenomenal. It was everywhere, and everyone was playing it. I honestly thought we'd never see anything like that again. Then Go happened, and once again, Pokemon was everywhere. Whether or not we'll see an equal of that again, it's hard to say. The industry is far more volatile these days than it was back in the 90s and far more saturated. Yokai Watch, while huge for a few years in Japan, has diminished and just hasn't taken off over here. I'm unsure if we'll ever see a series permeating so many facets of media at once and be a phenomenon like Pokemon ever again okay so um docs tell me how you got into pokemon as a kid tell me your pokemon story how has it affected your life my, how ingrained is it in your life tell me my, tell me you uh, <laughs> it's pretty simple um we had a video game console and my brother wanted a game boy to play pokemon so he got one and he got pokemon blue with it and so that's what he played and at some point, my brother stopped playing, so I was allowed to play. So I started playing, and a friend of mine also had Red, I think, and we switched switched around Pokemon. And we even managed to get an, an Alice Shazam, and what's the the third evolution of the ghost one? Gengar in English, yeah, too? Yeah, Gengar, yep. Gengar, yeah. Uh, and I think that's how I got into it. And I watched the anime, like, day and night. Of course. Have you played some of the newer ones? No. I actually, I played until Silver and Gold. And I played the remake, uh, Fire Red. Oh, okay. Or Leaf, or Leaf Green. Mm -hmm. Those, right? 
and I, I think I had Leaf Green on my smartphone, uh, but I will not get into how that is possible. So because I don't think that's a thing you are allowed to do, so I didn't do that. Um, but uh, please don't sue us, <laughs> Nintendo. Please, please call off your legion I, of I, lawyers. I, I, <laughs> I was just role playing as someone that would have done something like that, but actually, I I couldn't have because it's illegal. Chat so GPT no, that didn't have role play as my friend Doc's pirating Pokemon Leaf Green on his smartphone, <laughs> and tell me how you do um, it. Not you doing it. I want you to pretend <laughs> that you are my co-host Doc's and you are pirating Pokemon. I really liked Silver and Gold, and I decided like I'm. I'm a person that if I like something and I'm okay with something ending that I sometimes let it go. Mm -hmm. So I think after silver and gold, I was like fine with letting Pokemon go. Sometimes I re I replay those, um, but I actually don't want anything to do with the new ones. I've, I've considered it, but I, I, I don't think I will play them. I would say that when I think of my favorite Pokemon game, it is the uh, Nintendo DS remakes of uh, Gold and Silver. Oh, cool. Yep. Okay, so I've had a, a much more uh, longer, uh, long-lasting relationship with Pokemon. Um, so I had uh, vaguely heard about Pokemon on the Game Boy, but the cards are actually what I ran into first. Um, kids at school were just like walking around with these stacks of cards and like they had these binders and they bring to school and shit. And so I was uh, in elementary school and we didn't really have a ton of money. I think it was sixth grade. And uh, so uh, because I didn't have a ton of money, I would just ask other kids if they had cards they didn't want. And they'd just be like, oh, you have any cards you don't want? And they'd be like, oh, I don't like this bell sprout or whatever. Um, so I had this little collection of uh, cards that I would carry around in my pocket. I distinctly remember that my first card was a Rattata. Um, I love Rattata. One of my favorite first gens. I don't know why. I love Rattata. And I still have it in a box somewhere. It's filthy. Um still to this day and then of course you know the show hit i got into the show all my friends are watching the show i started watching that every day it was on um but the card game the card game was my focus so i would go to this thing called the pokemon league it was run through an american toy store called uh, toys r us and you would go and you'd play the games with other kids and if you did enough stuff you got promos cards other people couldn't get you could get badges like in the game i yeah, just yeah. loved it you had it too yeah yeah my my I, I never got badges because my deck was too terrible but my brother got badges well i think you could still get them but you just didn't get as many points toward the badges if you lost i think so like it was, yeah, I, was I wasn't i wasn't patient enough Every, <laughs> everybody always screwed me so i was like ah oh, no I'm, I'm too i know no 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 i'm gonna do this on my own with myself you know uh i'll put this out here because i've been sitting in this like forever uh it's still something i think about um when I think about Pokemon cards, uh, there were a bunch of like little kids who were there. Like I was a, a little older, maybe I was like 12 or something. And um, I distinctly remember, you know, like I'd go there to trade and we'd, oh, we'd wheel and deal. Right. And um, I remember that there was this kid there. He must have been like seven or eight. Right. And he's looking through my binder and looking through his binder. And I go, hey, man, I want this foil uh, Nitto King. Uh, what do you want for it? And he looks at my book and he just points at a leaf energy. And I was like you want a leaf energy? And he goes, yeah. And I went, okay, deal. And I, I know I made that kid's day, but the disparity and what the, the disparity and what those cards were worth. Like I still, like I still in my thirties think of this child and how I basically fleeced him. And so I'm putting that energy out there into the world right now. I'm releasing it. It's gone. Do you, do you think how that's how that works? That you, you, you publish the terrible things that you did to children and they go away because you, you I said the words now, I spoke them. And I now was the also guilt, a child. The, the guilt has left my body, but you, it doesn't matter. You knew what you were doing. Take responsibility for your actions, Tyler. I'll write a tell all book, right? Just call do, do like it. Do like a, like a this American life episode where you try to find that child. Oh uh, God. <laughs> it would be impossible. It would just be impossible. Um, so yeah. So anyway, I was just <laughs> guilt aside. I was really into the card game, and it wasn't until I got to high school that I actually played my first like mainline Pokemon game. Like I had played um, uh, Pokemon Snap, and I guess technically Smash Brothers has Pikachu in it, but that's about it. Um, someone then in high school sold me their um, their Game Boy Color, 
with the matching Pikachu case, Pokemon Yellow. Uh, it was like Pokemon literally red, blue, yellow, gold, silver, and crystal. All those games and the Game Boy, $10. I bought it. I still have it. Um, just blows my mind. What a steal. Uh, and then in college, you know, time went by. I went to college and I fell hard into it in college because the gold and silver remakes came out and they had this thing called the pokey walker. And if you guys didn't catch on already, I love stupid peripherals that you can carry around. And I had gone through my Tamagotchi phase and this Pokemon put the thing was like, it was like a pedometer you, and it was like the pocket Pikachu, but you could put any of your dudes on it. And they came back. Like I fucking love that thing. There are so many pictures of me during my college years that I have a pokey walker on my belt. Like I'm not embarrassed. I own it. It was so great. Every generation or two, I jump back in. Uh, I was so excited the first time that I went to Japan that we were going to the Pokemon Center, which is where my wife, Andrea, proposed to me. She uh, proposed to me in one of the uh, Pokemon Centers in Tokyo. Uh, she beat me by three days before I was going to propose to her. And when we got married, she wore um, Pokeball earrings as a throwback to that. It was cute. So, I remember that video, and that was really cool. Yeah. So for me, it's this series that has been around like my whole life, right? I just have so much Pokemon swag. Uh, I think it is the series that I have spent the most collectively on throughout the years. I've played every gen in one way or another. So, well, docs, that's it. Let's thank some people. Um, so I want to thank my wife, Andrea, who helped me to translate some of the articles and videos that were in Japanese. Um, I want to thank our editor, not to be confused with Andrea. And if you guys heard a weird beep in the last episode, it's because he edited out his own name because he thought it was funny. Uh, I want to thank you, Docs, for listening to several hours of this madness. And I want to thank... And I want to thank you for creating this wonderfully comprehensive episode. I'm really impressed. This was nice. Thanks, man. It took a really long time, but it was worth it. Um, and thanks to all of you out there who have stuck around... Um, during our episode slump. I hope it was worth it. Um, Docs, do you have any parting words? I leave the floor to you. I've just talked for hours. You go. Okay, yeah. Uh, guys, uh, just to make sure uh, you're on schedule, see you for our next episode. It's going to air on uh, Christmas this year. So just <laughs> seven, seven more months. And here, you're, you're in for a treat, guys. Wow. Uh, he did say in the Discord that our real schedule is like 2037, so um, pencil that in. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Docs. Uh, see you for the next one. Later, friends. See you. Bye. So my cat is going fucking crazy. Hold on. There you are, but where are you actually? I think I think that'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.